Ladies and gentlemen, internet, my name is Pradeom, and yes, this video is over three hours, and yes, this video is the ultimate compendium, the extravagant lexicon, the spicy tortilla wrap to bundle every winning game in Survivor all together into one massive video. All 40 winning games to date can be found here chronologically, and I have also put the timestamps in the description if you just want to hop around. For those out of the loop, before Winners at War premiered, I made a four-part series covering the roads to victory for every winner on that season. And then after Winners at War, I made a second four-part series covering everyone who wasn't. So this is every single part, all eight of them cut together. That said, I gotta say that the winners who weren't on season 40 did get a little bit more coverage in the long run. But regardless, that pretty much explains it all. So yeah, enjoy. Let's jump right into it with the first winner in Survivor history from all the way back in the year 2000 on the beaches of Malaysia, Pulau Tiga, with Richard Hatch in Survivor Season 1, Borneo. This is more than just a test of survival skills. It's also a test of social skills. Here, it's the impressions you make on the other castaways that determines your fate. To win, you must survive the island, survive the vote, and ultimately, survive each other. Richard Hatch entered the season as one of the only players who recognized this show was a game first and foremost. While everyone else was trying to figure out what the experience meant to them, Richard was mostly sizing up his competition, understanding they were in his way toward winning a million dollars. Not to say that the entire cast was just rolling over far from it, but Rich employed a rough draft of the Machiavellian style gameplay you would later see in almost every season. He was upfront to a select few people for strategic purposes, jumping on board the first successful alliance in Survivor history, the Tagi Four. This alliance is easily the most famous, comprised of Rich, Kelly, Rudy, and Sue. While in the first few votes they weren't on the same page, voting in different directions, Ultimately, they came together to form a powerful voting block that controlled the game from very early on all the way until the final four. Rich wasn't just a game player though. He was also a big provider for the tribe, catching fish on a daily basis, winning his tribe mates over by feeding them, and in some ways imbuing what the show was perceived to be about, survival. Through his hard work ethic around camp, as well as being well-educated and well-spoken, Rich won the respect of his peers, even if he sometimes came across as cocky or overly confident. At some point, even, he got entirely naked and just hung out around camp because, well, because it felt good. In the middle of the season, he literally wore his birthday suit on his birthday. There is a lot that can be said about the behind the scenes happenings on this season, probably more than any season in Survivor history, especially in the pre-merge, especially at the Tagi Beach, but ultimately the Tagi Four Alliance take control alongside their buddy Dr. Sean, who was a bit aloof with his strategy, and onward they marched into the merge with equal numbers, but not so much equal in their approach. The merge vote of Survivor Borneo may be the biggest shit show we will ever see in a vote result. Of the nine people who were eligible to receive votes, seven of them did. But the biggest takeaway here was that the Tagi four, Rich included, voted together and literally nobody else did. Because the opposition, the Pagong tribe, were all over the map. Most of them didn't want to create an alliance. They believed an alliance was counter to the spirit of the show. It was kind of like cheating. It was making it unfun. Why can't people just vote for whoever they want without having to be so affected by anyone else? It was the most innocent take you will ever get in Survivor. And while I appreciated the sentiment, even more so did Richard Hatch. It sounds like sheer stupidity to me when somebody says, oh no, I'm not going to build an alliance and I hope they wouldn't do that either. I, you know, I giggle and think, okay. What followed from here was a routing of the Pagong Alliance, also known eventually as a Paganging. From the final 10 to the final five, every Pagong tribe member was voted out. Now, it wasn't always easy. At one point, Kelly abandoned the Tagi Four Alliance because she was getting sick of them. But Rich always could rely on Dr. Sean to vote their way because he was voting based on the alphabet which conveniently meant he was also always voting for a Pagong tribe member. 
While this was intentional from Sean, Rich basically allocated the Alliance's votes alongside Sean's stray vote, knowing it was a reliable outlier, basically replacing Kelly's spot in the Alliance even if she wasn't voting their way. Sean was never in this alliance, but he was taken advantage of by them. At the final six, Rich intended to take out Kelly for being a rat, for butting up to the opposition and turning on the Toggies. She was outnumbered, but then she went on an immunity streak, winning four straight immunity challenges from the final six to the final three. Really clutch. Rich, however, had ingratiated himself so well within his alliance that he was safe under most circumstances. At the final four, he and Rudy voted out Sue, and eventually Kelly had to flip to do the same, to break the tie. Because Rich and Rudy were a near inseparable duo, Rich relied on Rudy as a guaranteed ally all season, a vote in his corner at all times. But Rich also knew he likely wouldn't beat Rudy in the final two. He was a really likable guy, so in the final immunity challenge, Rich threw it. He willingly stepped down, knowing this was the smartest move for him. Both Kelly and Rudy were going to take him to the end, and he couldn't cut Rudy, it would look terrible to the jury. So instead, he increased his odds of winning by decreasing Rudy's chances of being in the final two alongside him. Kelly won and took Rich to the final two as he expected, and ultimately, Rich won the game by a close vote, a photo finish, a four to three, where the biggest snake of the season ate the most formidable rat. Or so says Sue. The winner of the first survivor competition is Rich. So now we move on to the second winner from Survivor the Australian Outback. Following on the heels of Richard Hatch, we have Tina Wesson. Tina may just be the most unique winner in 40 seasons, unable to be replicated, as I've seen some fans claim she is one of the most calculated puppet master winners, while others would just happen to rank her pretty low. So where's the truth? Perhaps the most important factor going into season two with Tina was that she wasn't interested in being perceived as a villain like Richard Hatch from the previous season in front of 35 million people each episode each week. Tina preferred to be the hero, I think most people would, but she saw how being strategic from the first season kind of painted Rich in a negative light, in a taboo light. Again, this is a very unique circumstance for a Survivor winner that you just won't see again. First things first, Tina was intentionally hid in the premiere episode as a stark contrast to Rich, who declared himself the winner in the premiere episode of Borneo. But Tina entered her eight-person tribe in a majority alliance of five, which makes sense. Herself, Colby, Amber, Jerry, and Mitchell. So this alliance first picks off Kel and Mad Dog to Outsiders. And from here, this is where Tina comes alive. With six people, Tina realizes that she's on the bottom of this alliance. Sure, the six man, Keith, he's going next. But after that, she has no power, no ability to control the flow of the eliminations. So episode four is a massive turning point. Tina rallies Keith to her side and then tries to flip Mitchell, but he's in a good spot and he doesn't want to go against the grain. On the way to tribal council, off camera, Tina manages to convince Colby to join her and Keith to vote out Mitchell because he was providing the least for the camp and was the least malleable and he also had a vote cast against him from the previous tribal, which meant that in a tie vote, three for him and say three for Keith, Mitchell would go as the tiebreaker was based around past votes. None of this strategy was caught on camera, but we do see glimpses of it when Tina goes to vote. And just like that, Tina is now in the driver's seat. This was a huge move for early Survivor. The first time power was usurped from the player at the bottom. Unprecedented and impressive. Likewise, Tina manages to casually get some really important information out of Kimmy, a player on the opposing tribe, while they're idling at a challenge. Tina learns that Deb, the first boot of this season, voted for Jeff Varner, meaning he had a vote against him and could lose a tiebreaker if Tina got lucky. And at the merge, five versus five, they got more than lucky. Tina ensured that Keith, the tribe mate with the most votes in her alliance, won immunity. She and Colby also made sure that the other tribe would vote for him as he had no prior votes cast against him. Colby acted a bit aggro and drew their attention away from Jerry who had two votes prior cast against her. I'm going through all the little numbers here in the details because all of this is important to note. It dictated the rest of the season. This one vote was so crucial. It enabled Tina to be the winner. 
she was able to decide the boot order, creating a layered, perhaps onion-like alliance with herself and Colby at the core, then Keith, and then Amber and Jerry on the outs. She also bonded strongly with Roger and Elizabeth, which allowed her options to pick off her own alliance at the final eight and the final six and not have to worry about any blowback. Everyone revolved around her and her sweet, respectable nature. It could be argued that Tina, despite not winning an immunity all season, had her final two seat locked up as early as the final nine, to where she had even convinced Colby to take her to the final two and lose to her, despite him having the very easy win against Keith. Tina definitely attempted to play the hero in spite of being very tactical and deliberate, almost manipulative in her calculations. She desired to reward the good guys of the season, such as taking Roger and Elizabeth a little bit farther, but ultimately she was there for her and her alone. I think Tina is more deserving because she has really played this game. It wasn't winning seven or eight challenges that got her here. It was strategy and using her head. She's a smart woman and I think she deserves it. From being at the bottom very early to comfortably sitting at the top by the end, Tina beat Colby in a close four to three vote to become the second winner and the first woman to win the game. The winner of Survivor, the Australian Outback. <laughs> the winner of 2001's Survivor, Africa, Ethan Zorn, Zahn, Ethan Zahn. Ethan Zorn, now millionaire. Ethan is generally regarded as one of the most likable, positive winners in Survivor history, both statistically from edit analysis and fan reception. I would say he is the most positive, and after 37 seasons since his original appearance, I don't think that's going to change. Ethan began on the Yellow Boran tribe and connected with two of the biggest players that season, Big Tom and Lex. The three of them were the Boran boys and they dominated the season, though not in like a heavy handed way. They never came across as very dominant or oppressive like other strong alliances, probably because there were only three of them and they never really had like a strong majority. They just sort of insulated themselves really well and were all rather likable enough for the other players to circle around them. Ethan was by far the most likable of them all, and that's really the biggest selling point of his story. Ethan doesn't have as many strategic moments to hang his hat on compared to the other winners in this video. He was always somewhere near the top of the pecking order, but never at the forefront. He was the assistant coach to the ringleader in Lex, so much so that he never even received a vote against him all season. He was a part of the first ever tribe swap in Survivor history at the final 12, where he pulled off perhaps his biggest move, throwing a challenge to eliminate his biggest threat, Silas. This may sound crazy and I've never done this in my life. I'm a, you know, I'm an athlete. I go out to win, I've never fixed anything. I'm like, what, what would you think if we lost this next challenge on purpose? From there, Ethan entered the merge with numbers, but it was largely Lex who pulled the strings, winning over Brandon at the final nine to keep the majority, as he and the Baran boys marched their way to the end. Ethan did also manage to lead the charge against Brandon at the final eight, cementing his position as Lex's continued right-hand man. The Baran boys were poised to be the top three of the season, except the fourth member in their alliance, Kim, won immunity at the final four and the final three, but because Ethan was never the puppet master, he was able to get taken to the final two where he handily won over Kim. He was likable, diplomatic, cool, calm, collected. He did return for Survivor All-Stars in season eight, but he was voted out in 11th place, having a major target on his back as a former winner. It does need to be said, he was the last winner of all of those targets in All-Stars to get voted out, so there is something he could hang his hat on for that season. Both him and Amber Burkich Mariano have a 32 season gap since they last played Survivor, and it'll be this gap in time that'll tell us if Ethan is ready to adapt to the modern game, where a tribe swap will be the least of his worries. Ethan is old school to the T, but as we just saw in season 39, the social game reigns supreme, and that, by far and away, was his strongest asset when he won. The winner of Survivor Africa. <laughs> Next up is season four, Survivor Marquesas, with the prayer warrior, Vesepia Towery. 
one of the most overlooked winners through 40 seasons, though if you asked me to put money on any one winner to seize the day in an all-star season, it would most likely be her. Vesepia's game is very understated. She played rather quiet and wasn't shown very much in comparison to other big names on her cast, but Marquesas is one of the most important seasons in Survivor history, and she won it, so let's get right to it. First off, gotta be said, V began on one of the least successful, least winning tribes in all of Survivor, Maramu. She bonded quickly with her tribe mate Sean as they mused over the fact that they were somewhat on their own and they were both the only two minorities in the entire cast. At the first tribal council, Peter was voted out, and while we didn't see a ton of strategy or a ton of reasons why, it's probably because of how eccentric he came off. Vesepia targeted Sarah, a high-maintenance woman who didn't bring much to the tribe, but V did not get her way. That said, Vesepia's game really takes a turn after this first vote. She demonstrates her adaptability by joining a four-person alliance in a tribe of seven alongside Sean, Boston Rob, or just Rob at the time, and Sarah, the woman she had just targeted. Together, these four controlled the tribe, especially Boston Rob, who is trying his best to be this young godfather archetype. Both Patricia and then Hunter were taken out in subsequent episodes, with V voting for both of them, and the Hunter boot being very significant in the evolution of the game, as it was the first time a major threat and camp provider was voted off so early, just episode 3. Hunter was the big man on campus, and just like that, he was gone not but 9 days into the season. An unbalanced tribe swap happens at the final 15, and V is now flat out on the bottom, alongside her allies Sean and Rob. But unlike Sean and Rob, V attempts to ingratiate herself with the opposing tribe mates, ensuring she wouldn't be targeted first if one of them was taken out. In fact, on the flip side of all this, the opposing Rotu tribe took out one of their own in a 7-1 vote against Gabe, partially because Gabe appeared to be the least reliable member. He was kind of playing like they were still in Borneo, but Gabe, this is season 4. This is New School Survivor. V makes the merge, but her only allies are still just Rob and Sean in a tribe of 10. Never has a winner had worse odds through four seasons. And of course, go figure, Rob gets targeted and voted out right away for being a loudmouth, both him and Sean butt heads with John, the leader of the opposing tribe. So now V is down two to seven through no faults of her own, facing what should be impossible odds. And then, things get really interesting. Dare I say, one of the most interesting things through 40 seasons. The final nine immunity challenge reveals the pecking order of the seven Rotu members. Clearly, V and Sean are at the bottom. They're not from Rotu, but what about the other seven? We see Kathy, Pascal, and Nalia are all in the minority of the Rotus, so once they get to seven, there's already a final four in place. Both V and Sean fight to flip the bottom of the Rotus, and what do you know, in a complete shift of power, overthrowing the big man on campus, John is voted out at the final nine. And outside of a power lines forming in Borneo, this move here is probably the biggest in Survivor history, unprecedented to have people who didn't know each other come together and have three flip on four alongside the two at the very bottom. I know this sounds basic from the lens of a modern Survivor fan, but it wasn't back then. It was game changing in every sense of the term and V was in the thick of it. You know how people always say everything is not perfect? When you get back from a challenge, you find out just how everything is not always perfect. At the challenge, there was a, quite a bit of cockiness with Tammy, Zoe, Big Rob, and John. Nalee and Pascal, I think, are really supporting my success in this game and are really rooting for me. And knowing that you can rely upon those two people, I mean, it's like two free passes. From here, we get a pagonging of sorts where the opposing alliance is taken out one by one. They lopped off the head of the snake and the rest followed, leaving V at the final five with her fellow merry band of misfits. However, Kathy, the swing vote between two pairs, decided to go with her older trimates in Nalia and Pascal, taking out Sean, leaving V yet again on the bottom. But this was probably a mistake as V had prepared one of the most ingenious moves in Survivor history, one that even I regrettably forgot to include in my most ingenious moves series from a year ago, the doi. My biggest omission in any video to date, 
V knew that there would be a challenge down the line involving knowing your tribe mates and their personal lives. She kept a journal as a personal item because every player gets a personal item and all season she took notes in it about details pertaining to the rest of the cast, just for this one moment. I'm not gonna sit there and try to compare notes with those guys. This immunity is too important for me. I know where Patricia's from, but that's why I said I think it starts with the L. I know exactly where she's from. One of the goals that I had while I was here was to develop a relationship with everyone and know as much as I can about them. I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna play the best immunity game that I can. If I don't win it, I know I'm out of here. And so be it. Armed with a ton of knowledge, she downplayed how much she knew and went into the final four challenge, easily crushing it, securing herself safe passage to the final three. She knew this was coming and totally gamed the system to her advantage. Likewise, she then threw the final challenge after making a deal with Nalia to take out Kathy, knowing Kathy was the biggest threat remaining. Again, this so rarely happens in Survivor, let alone this early in the show, to see a challenge thrown this late in the game, but it was excellent foresight, even though it may have lost her Kathy's vote, it, it didn't really matter. This was still great gameplay. V still won against a weaker opponent, another four to three close vote, playing one of the most underrated and overlooked games we have ever seen. She didn't need to control the game at any point, just getting good enough to never be the next target until it was too late for the rest of them. The winner of Survivor Marquesas. <laughs> Season five, Survivor Thailand, and oh boy, here we go. Brian Heideck is also one of the most unique winners in my opinion, if only because he has got to be one of the least emotional people we have ever seen play the game. I mean, this guy was cutthroat, everything about him was matter of fact, straightforward, but also on point, strategically at least. He was a used car salesman and yeah, I see it. Transactional, that is the word for Brian. Despite being unemotional, he was fairly likable, got in good with just about everyone, yet also just states it plainly. This is a business trip, I'm here to make money. Let's put on our ice skates and skate to the end. Brian was Mr. Freeze, rarely showing any qualms with the decisions he had to make, the people he had to cut. He played about as robotic as you can get, and I don't say that in a negative light. Just, well, about as matter-of-factly as Brian might. He joined the majority for the first two votes of his tribe, proving to be a good provider winning over his tribe mates. He had secured a comfortable spot with fellow tribe mates Helen, Ted and Clay, and after the first vote, this foursome controlled the game, picking off Tanya and then Gandia, two of the three outsiders. Now a major fiasco arose before the Gandia vote off, where Ted and Gandia had an incident involving some nighttime grinding that at first came across as a small issue being resolved by the two people involved, but then Brian probed Ted about what happened and Ted undersold the events to Brian, upon which Brian disseminated these remarks from Ted to Helen and suddenly it got back to Gandia and yeah, Brian kinda blew this moment up unintentionally. Or maybe intentionally, I'm not 100% sure. It's one of those defining moments of the season which is why I bring it up and it's important to note that Brian is very much at the center of why it blew up so much although clearly so was Ted. Really, it's just not a great moment altogether and it leads to Gandia being taken out soon after, which will end up paying dividends down the line for Brian as they could have easily cut Jan here instead of Gandia. From here, Brian makes the merge, or the fake merge. The two tribes shared one beach, but they're not yet one tribe, even though they all believe they are. Both tribes came together five versus five, but because it was still a tribal game and Brian's tribe won the next two immunity challenges, his tribe now had the numbers five to three at the final eight. And yeah, easy pickings from here on out. Brian leads his tribe to take out the remaining three players from the other tribe once they do merge at the final eight, leading him to the final five. Really, sounds like a bit of a cakewalk, but along the way to get there, Brian lays the foundation for what allows him to be so well positioned in the end game. First, Brian had a strong day one alliance with Ted. The two of them worked in near lockstep all season. Second, by the merge, Brian formed another strong bond with Clay. Both Ted and Clay viewed Brian as their number one ally. Third, Brian formed a strong relationship with Helen, whom he was also viewed as her number one ally. By the family visit episode, Helen even told her husband she couldn't turn on Brian despite the fact that her husband was like, 
you should probably turn on Brian. See, Brian will play fair and with integrity, Clay won't. Clay's out for Clay, he's a selfish son of a gun, and he'll cut everybody's throat here if he thinks it'll get him the million. She said she couldn't turn on him because he was a great guy and he didn't deserve that. They had too tight of a bond for her to go with anyone else. Brian had a working relationship with Jan, but Jan was at the bottom of the five and thus was somewhat on the out strategically. She was kind of dragged along, but still, Brian had sway over her as well as whereas the rest of them, they just kind of didn't. Lastly, Brian bonded with Jake, the final remaining member of the opposing tribe. The two of them went fishing, clamming, just spent time on the water, chatting away. Brian's social game was surprisingly strong for someone with little emotion to speak of. So once the end game approaches, he has every option available to the point where he just straight blindsides everyone because none of them think that he's going to turn on them. He lies to Ted as he votes out Ted, then lies to Helen at the final four as she goes. He wins several immunities, preventing him from being voted out, but likewise, I don't think he goes anyway. He had too many allies willing to take him to the final three at least. Brian ultimately chose to go with Clay and Jan to the final three, which was a perfect combination for him. Clay was not well respected by the jury and would be an easier beat than the rest. Well, Jan was physically the weakest and thus likely doesn't beat him in immunity. And yeah, guess what? Both happened. Brian won the final three immunity, voted out Jan, and took Clay to the final two. And while the final vote was close, another four to three, it's important to note that Clay was never ever getting those four votes that went to Brian. Jake was just way closer to Brian than Clay. Ted despised Clay, even wondered if he was racist. Jan enjoyed Brian a lot more. Clay was kind of condescending toward Jan. And Helen, well, <laughs> Helen was livid at Brian for her blind side, but Clay's answer to her jury question all but guaranteed she could never vote for him. Brian may not have received the first three jurors' votes, but he had the rest on lock. Ultimately, Brian was an emotionless robot. His family visit tape watching was awkward. He tried to downplay his wife's behavior as well as how well off his house appeared. Did he really need the money? He also made some questionable and sexist remarks. He was the biggest villain winner then and may still hold that title after 20 years, but he's also well respected as a game player for just how smooth of an operator he was. He was Cool Hand Luke, Mr. Freeze. He managed to luck out a bit with the numbers by the merge, but he had set himself up so well by the end that he was still the cream of the crop as far as gameplay goes. The winner of Survivor Thailand. Brian. And then lastly, for part one, we get to Jenna Maraska, the youngest winner through six seasons and the youngest female to win Survivor even to this day. Survivor of the Amazon, season six, split the tribes by gender, eight men and eight women. Jenna, being young and fairly attractive, was not happy with this, as she believed playing with some of the guys would go a longer way than a bunch of older women. Probably the case, given most of the guys' tribe were doing nothing but talking about her through half of this pre-merge. Jenna was a popular subject for the younger guys' tribe, who kind of behaved like a frat. But nonetheless, Jenna bonded with two women in Heidi and Shauna, also on the younger side of the women's tribe, as well as Dina, who was the most strategic female on the cast. Together, these four women controlled the game and picked off the outsiders, first with Janet and then with Joanna. Lastly, they targeted Jean. Indeed, Jenna had to be the last J name standing and Dr. Sean's alphabet strategy finally was being followed up on five seasons later. No, but really, after four episodes at the final 12, Jenna was whisked away to a special reward being the youngest woman in the game. Joining the youngest man, Dave, the two spent a night together eating food and showering and gossiping. Jenna accidentally got a little too loose-lipped and revealed all of the inner workings of the women's tribe and... Then the next morning, Jeff Probst arrived and had the two of them divvy up the new swapped tribes. Because Dave knew about all of the women's tribe dynamics, he split up Jenna and Heidi, weakening her and her number one ally. But it turned out it wasn't the worst outcome as Jenna was able to ingratiate herself well enough with her newly swapped tribe alongside Rob Sesternino, Matthew, 
and Alex. Also, Dina and Shauna, two former allies. And Shauna basically flipped on Jenna, not sure how strategic she was here, but the moment that Shauna laid eyes on Alex, oof. She was ready to jump ship and go with the guys. Except Jenna and Dina pivoted to work alongside Rob and Matt, meaning Shauna would go if they ever went to tribal, which they did, and Shauna went. The tribes merge and the women were at a six to four disadvantage, but because of the swap dynamics, it was less about men versus women at this point and more about the individual players. Really, it became a seven to three dynamic with Roger, Dave, and Butch on the bottom, Three guys whose social games were rather poor. Roger was blasted out at the merge unceremoniously, followed by Dave at the final nine. Within that majority seven alliance at the merge, there were five controlling the votes, Jenna being a number in that group, alongside Heidi, Alex, Rob, and Dina. And at the final eight, Dina wanted to preemptively turn on the alliance by voting out Alex. While it wasn't a bad idea, Alex was a big threat. Jenna really didn't like this. She was really close to Alex, and both her and Heidi joined Rob and Alex to turn on Dina. This would then leave Jenna, Heidi, Alex, and Rob in the final seven with a clear majority over the three on the bottom in Butch, Christy, and Matt. But then Rob Sesternino happened, as he does, and he really ping-ponged back and forth to the end game. Rob was the sly strategist that was vastly underestimated by the rest of the cast, and the moment he saw an opening, he took it. Alex made a bad comment to Rob at the final seven when he revealed that he, Jenna, and Heidi would turn on Rob at the final four. Well, <laughs> Rob didn't like that outcome, so he shifted gears and voted with the bottom three players to take out Alex, now leaving Jenna and Heidi on the outs. Really, for the first time all game, Jenna was in a really bad spot and likely should have gone home in the next two votes. Jenna was feeling sick and greatly missed her mother back home who had cancer and wanted to quit the game by this point. She had even asked to be voted out, but then went on to win immunity. It appeared Heidi was screwed. One of the two women were going, no thanks to Rob, her former ally whom she really didn't like anymore for taking out Alex. But Rob approached her at the last second before the vote before tribal council and offered her an olive branch, a new deal. They would all vote out Christy, one of Jenna's adversaries all game. Christy was the swing vote. She debated joining Jenna and Heidi to tie the vote three men to three women, but Rob undercut her and worked with Jenna to take out Christy, removing the middle woman. Jenna likewise gave up her immunity necklace to Heidi, the first time ever in Survivor history, to protect her and ensure that Heidi wasn't going home. Jenna rather would have left over Heidi, and if anyone was getting votes, she would have preferred it to be her. Also, important to note that Rob viewed Jenna as a GOAT, a player who could easily be beat in the end, especially given she wasn't feeling great physically or mentally and it kind of checked out. So as much as she despised Rob for turning on her one round prior, she also recognized he was an asset to her survival. But Heidi was still a big threat and at the final five, she was voted out, leaving Jenna as the last woman standing in a men versus women season. She was the youngest and now the sole representative for their tribe against Rob. Rob, Matt, and Butch. From here, Jenna was certainly on the bottom and likely gets voted out at fourth or third had she not won immunity, but go figure, she went on to win both of the final immunities and guaranteed herself a spot in the final two, where she ended up taking Matthew to join her, a player whose social game was really weak. He wasn't respected much by anyone. He was kind of strung along by Rob all season as an extra vote. In spite of Jenna's lack of dominance or clever moves all season, shifting and cutting people left and right, she was still well liked by most of the cast, arguably having the strongest social game of anyone. Don't underestimate people because they're a woman or because they're small or skinny or something. Being here taught me that I can push beyond my limits, way beyond I ever could think, and that is like a valuable life lesson, especially for me being so young. Like, I feel like I can do anything right now. Anything that you throw at me, I can handle. She had numerous votes on Locke from early on, most certainly Dave, Alex, and Heidi, and given Dina was in favor of a woman winning, a far cry from Roger, the merge boot, who was t intentionally left off of the jury since he was not in favor of a woman winning, you begin to realize, yet again, just how much Survivor as a game is focused on connections and less on blindsides. In fact, I think there's a good argument to be made that Jenna even beats Rob in the final vote. Jenna won six to one over Matt, the largest margin of any winner yet, and it was shocking to the viewing audience given Matt wasn't so dislikable in the edit, whereas Jenna, 
She didn't curry favor by wanting to quit, wasn't a huge game player, and didn't have a loud voice. She's still regarded as one of the weaker winners strategically, and I see why, but nonetheless, she has continued to carry that social torch, demonstrating how important being able to jive with the rest of the cast really is. The winner of Survivor, Amazon. Yeah! Next winner, Queen Stays Queen, it's Sandra Diaz Twine. Don't say it twice, no, just kidding. Please do, because she's the only two-time winner going into Winners at War. Sandra, good luck preventing another two-timer from happening. Sandra won both Season 7, Pearl Islands, as well as Season 20, Heroes vs. Villains. And amusingly enough, she employed a very similar strategy both times that proved to be very successful. Sandra's overall strategy can be chalked up to anyone but me. In other words, as long as she's not receiving the votes, it doesn't really matter who is. And given she's won twice, you gotta imagine, if it ain't her, who cares? It works. That being said, despite her mantra being anyone but her, Sandra did form a strong three-person alliance with Krista and Rupert on Pearl Islands, and that alliance really was a sticking point for their duration in the game. The three of them voted together throughout the pre-merge, and going into the merge were poised to go really far. Johnny Fairplay managed to pull a fast one on them and blindsided Rupert at the final eight, leading to Sandra getting pretty dang unhappy. But this was Sandra at her least comfortable, and yet also at some of her best. Her biggest move of that season took place at the final five, where she managed to bring together three very different women, herself, Lil, and Dara, to work together to seize the day over the boys in Burton and Johnny, who really believed they had gotten the better of the women and were taking them all for a ride. With Burton blindsided, Sandra was taken to the final two by Lil, where Sandra won convincingly six to one. She was brash and blunt and told it like it is, but her sass and relatability endeared her to the jury over her fellow finalist. Also, because of a big twist that allowed players to come back into the game at the merge, it's important to note that Sandra was never voted out in the pre-merge. The winner of Survivor Pro. In the first ever All-Star season featuring returning players, we saw Amber Burkich, later Mariano, go on to become the eighth winner in Survivor history. Amber is best known for, for marrying Boston Rob, her cohort in crime, as they marched their way to the final two in Survivor All-Stars. Really, the two biggest aspects of Amber's game both hinge around Rob. And go figure, she's back again, and she's with Rob. First, she formed a solid alliance with him on day one. And second, she was a tad bit nicer than him all game, ultimately netting her the win over him once they faced the jury on day 39. The only dubious moment Amber faced was at the halfway point in the season, a tribe swap hit, and awkwardly enough, of the 10 people in the game, Amber was the only one to switch tribes. Her tribe had numbers 6-4, to four, and then suddenly they were evened out 5-5, to five, with Amber swapping all by herself. Now, how is she going to get out of this pickle? Well, she does, for two major reasons. First, Boston Rob leveraged his pregame alliance with Lex and Kathy to ensure her safety, promising Lex and Kathy safety if they saved Amber. And two, Amber herself made arguably her biggest move by making a deal with Lex and Kathy to take them to the final five alongside Rob and Big Tom. So Amber escaped near death, and then Rob mercilessly blindsided Lex and Kathy right after, and so because of that, by the time the two lovebirds had reached the end and were ready to face the music, Amber happened to be seen as the less vile of the two, the more innocent, and was therefore more worthy of winning given Rob lacked tact and grace in his game. Whether you agree or disagree, the underlying point is that sometimes less can be more. You don't always need to be the puppet master of the game to win. How you treat players is incredibly important, and if there was ever one player, I believe will be underestimated more than probably anyone else going into winners at war, it's Amber. She's kind, friendly, understated, probably overlooked, and clearly knows how to hang with the best of them. You don't win the first All-Stars by doing nothing, even if that something was marrying your final two opponent. The winner of Survivor All-Stars. <laughs> Just 
jumping in to Season 9 Survivor Vanuatu Islands of Fire with the one, the only, the man with the master plan may not have had a frame, but he had a brain. It's Chris Doherty. Chris entered the season similar to Jenna Maraska from the Amazon, young, pretty, and overlooked. Well, okay, maybe not the last part, as Chris finds himself in hot water by the end of the premiere episode. Season 9 was split into two tribes, men versus women, and Chris is on a tribe with eight other guys, which he says he prefers as he believes men are generally easier to manipulate than women. I can outsmart eight men a hell of a lot quicker than I can outsmart eight women. Women stick together, they're thick as thieves. Men are deceiving, mischievous, untrusting human beings. Men I can manipulate. Right away, Chris blows the first challenge pretty bad. He's the sole reason his tribe loses as he can't cross a balance beam to save himself. Thankfully, Survivor is not about outbalancing. On his tribe of nine guys, four of the more fit men band together to create a quote unquote fit for alliance. And then they approach Sarge to have the majority. Except Sarge is closer to the rest of the men and he joins up with them instead, including Chris. This alliance calls themselves the Fat Five. And even though Chris has his name written down several times by the opposing alliance in the premiere episode, he doesn't get voted out as his Fat Five alliance holds the majority. In fact, he even tells us he never thought he was in trouble in the first place. And this tribal council will be the last time all season Chris will have his name written down to be voted out. In the pre-swap portion of the game, Chris was never in trouble, having numbers the whole way. They lost two more challenges and booted two more of the fit four, giving them four solid tribals of safety before their alliance ever needed to turn on each other. But then a lopsided swap happens. Also, a massive earthquake happens. Both Equally terrifying, Chris is distributed onto a swapped tribe where the men hold the majority 4-2, to two, with the two new women on the tribe being Twyla and Julie. Chris forms a bond with both of the women, as well as with John, the guy on the bottom of the four from the Fit Four. Chris still has Sarge and Chad with him, at least half the tribe, and with that comes the power position. The Fat Three get to decide who stays and who goes, and it's only at the final 11, the round right before the merge, that they find themselves having to vote someone out. On the other tribe, one man and one woman were voted out, meaning at present there were six women and five men. So. If Chris voted off John, the last remaining member of that older opposing alliance, the men would be at a disadvantage at the merge 6-4. to four. If they voted off Twyla or Julie, they would have numbers 5-5. to five. And what's more, John trusted Chris the most of anyone. Yet, Chris turned around and voted John out at the final 11. What happened? Personally, I think Chris was in a lose-lose situation here because John wanted to flip on Lopevi. He targeted Chad at this tribal council already ready to turn on the guys. He wanted to get Chris and everyone else to take out Chad to trust that Julie and Twyla were with the guys going forward, but so did Chris. But if Chris kept John, perhaps voted out a woman like, I don't know, Julie or someone, then Twyla is probably on the outs, let alone John, who wanted the Fat Five decimated anyway. Basically what I'm saying is it's a tough spot either way. And it's not as simple as just men versus women. Or so we thought. The biggest factor going into this merge was that indeed the men were now down six to four in numbers. And while Rory joined back up with Chris as he didn't care much for the women on the other swap tribe, Chris had all of his eggs in both Julie and Twyla's basket, the two women he entrusted in the previous vote to stay with them to the end. But Julie didn't want to work with the men and managed to keep Twyla with the women and so come the first vote and really the next three votes, Chris and the men were blindsided one by one until only he was left. Chris was legit shocked to see these two women turn on him, but in the wake of this devastation, he kept his cool and he kept his mouth shut. Whereas Sarge was pissed, Chris was just disappointed. And instead he focused on making inroads with the women because he knew some of them were on the bottom of this six person alliance and even one of them wanted to flip for a few rounds now, that being Scout. And while a coup almost occurred at the final eight and the final nine, it took until the final seven when Chris was the last man standing to seize the moment and strike. I've covered this final seven vote a good amount on my channel. It's one of my favorite votes ever, but basically 
The women at the top revealed the pecking order to those on the bottom, particularly Leanne to Scout. She revealed that Julie had moved up, and Scout and Twyla were down alongside Eliza who was at the bottom. And because Chris was the great guy and he loved his wife and really appealed to their emotions, they deemed Eliza less worthy of staying. She was the new target at the final seven. And this was a terrible move for Amy, for Leanne, and for Julie. Like, real bad. Like a majority wasn't even needed to take the power here because if Amy, Leanne, and Julie vote for Eliza and then Chris, Twyla, and Scout vote for whoever, Eliza becomes a throwaway vote who is also revealed to be on the bottom by the remaining women in the minority. Basically, Scout gets Twyla on board to turn on the women and Twyla ropes in Chris because they have a working relationship. Now the idea here is to flip Eliza given she's the target to seize a four to three majority but Eliza wasn't even needed. But you know what, they still got her anyway. Let the infighting begin. And Chris, <laughs> Chris is off to the races. Just goes to show, you open your heart, it goes a long way. And now Chris is in the clear majority of himself, Twyla, Scout, and Eliza, and they pick off Amy at the final six, leading us to the final five and then the final four. Chris is the pivotal vote at the final five between two duos, Twyla, Scout, and then Julie and Eliza. They're hinging on his vote. He didn't win immunity, but he didn't really need to. He had BS'd his way into their good graces like a big brother pulling a fast one on a younger sister. He chose to go with Twyla and Scout to the final four and then the final three because they would be physically easier to beat, and in the case of Twyla, socially in front of the jury. Chris won both of the last two immunities at the final four and the final three and pulled off the most enjoyably overacted BS final tribal council performance we have ever seen. But I gotta say, regardless of how real or fake his answers were, how much he believed them, they worked. It's a great example of where going over the top and speaking with a boatload of conviction can get you a lot. And in this case, it got Chris five of the seven jury votes, one of the best underdog stories through 40 seasons, and a million dollar check. The winner of Survivor Vanuatu. <laughs> and now we get to season 10, Palau, with the firefighter Tom Westman, one of the most dominant and unique winners in all of Survivor. And by unique, I mean Tom's story and game really start halfway into the season at the merge, if you can call it that because of how strong his starting tribe is at the immunity challenges. No joke, Tom's Karor tribe wins all seven pre-merge immunity challenges, completely decimating and conquering the other tribe, Oolong, reducing them to just one player halfway into the season. Wild. So what does Tom do to set himself up to succeed in the meantime, you know, in like the first half of the game? Well, he becomes the leader of his tribe, catches a great white shark, and is basically looking like a silver fox for three straight weeks. Out of the gates, before the tribes even form, he creates strong bonds with Ian, Katie, and Stephanie, and they form a four-person alliance on day two. However, tribes this season were determined by a schoolyard pick'em and two players, Jonathan and Wanda, were instantly eliminated. <sighs> Thankfully, they both returned four more times, rivaling the iconic status of Boston Robin Sandra, but that is a story for another timeline. Tom gets separated from Stephanie on his starting tribe, but forms a majority alliance with Ian, Katie, Greg, and Jen, leaving Karen, Janu, Kobe, and Willard on the outs. The only time Karor goes to tribal council in the pre-merge, they voted out Willard for being weak in the challenges, probably the right call. And mind you, this was a tribal council that they had to go to because it was a double boot episode, both tribes were going. Karen is now on the outs, and Tom forms a solid friendship with her as well as with Janu, and at this point, the only player Tom isn't connected strongly with is Kobe. So the merge happens, again we're just fast forwarding here to the final nine, and it's basically Tom's alliance versus the three outsiders and the one person he formed an alliance with on day two, that being Stephanie, the lone Oolong tribe member remaining. Steph joined them and would appear to be the target, but Janu was ready to quit the game. She had starved enough and was sick of playing, she wanted out, and the idea was to mercy kill her at the first merge vote. Well, her idea anyway. Meanwhile, Tom rallied both Steph and Karen and his alliance, and they voted out Kobe. Afterward, the vote was to go to Stephanie for being on the outs, but Janu quit before the vote, allowing Stephanie to be spared for one round. At the final seven, all eyes were on Steph, and Tom didn't actually want her to go, 
But then a woman's alliance was brought up and Karen was closer to Tom than Katie or Jen and Steph. She revealed this to Tom and yeah, Steph goes and this idea is just nipped in the bud. So final six, the last time Tom Westman doesn't win immunity and could have been voted out this season. He's close with Karen and Ian, the guy he had sworn to take to the final three alongside Katie, but they began to realize that Katie was getting closer to Greg and Jen than Tom and Ian, and this was troubling because even though Karen was supposed to be the boot here, they realized their goose may be cooked in the next vote, they won't have the numbers. They decided to blindside Greg, and right before Tribal, Ian brought Katie into the fold, and she realized if the vote was going to be 3-3, three to three, rocks would get drawn and both her and Tom would be left to Lady Luck. Her bond with Ian got her to flip. Tom now has the numbers, but he also wins the final five, final four, and final three immunity challenges. Nonetheless, he does take Karen out next, and then, because Ian really screws up his relationship with Katie and Tom at the end, he kinda, he kinda turns on Tom and schemes against him. The horror. Tom justifies tying the vote on Ian at the final four, breaking the final three pack they had made. Ian gets dragged over the coals by both Tom and Katie for not taking certain players on reward challenges and then turning on allies in the end game. It gets pretty dark for the guy, and even though he wins the fire making challenge at the final four, he basically loses his desire to win the game going into the final immunity challenge. I believe Katie was banking on either herself or Ian winning this challenge to take them to the final two, but Tom and Ian stayed in this final challenge and endurance challenge for 11 hours and 55 minutes, just chilling on some buoys long into the night to eventually see Ian make a deal with Tom. Tom, I give you immunity and you vote me out. Wait, what? Wait, what? Yeah, Ian just wanted Tom's friendship back at this point, so he gave up the money to get it back. Tom votes him out and goes on to beat Katie in the final two, really without much of a doubt, ensuring we will never, ever see another standard endurance challenge in US Survivor history for the rest of our lives. You know, it's bittersweet. It's, it's, it's been tough yet, but it's been the experience of a lifetime, and uh, yeah, I think we're gonna take this place apart with a little lump in our throat. Tonight, um, no treachery or half-truths or, or sugarcoating things. Uh, whatever I did got me to where I am right now, and uh, so be it. Now it's in their hands, not mine. The winner of Survivor <laughs> With season 11, Survivor Guatemala, we had Danny Boatwright, who played so far under the radar, she practically beat the radar, as she said. Danny is the most underrated Survivor winner to date, and her Guatemala win is the most forgotten about in the annals of Survivor history. Why is that? Well, Danny played a very quiet game, kind of similar to Amber, but even less in front as she wasn't attached to the hip of anyone. She stated postseason that she purposefully hid herself from the producers to avoid them accidentally revealing her strategy to other players. She downplayed her game to keep it all under wraps. And why not? Sure, you can put on a show for us, but ultimately you are there to win. Survivor is a game, and the producers are definitely a part of it for better and even sometimes for worse. So if we didn't really get to see much of Danny, what's her story? Danny's game comes alive at the swap as she only visits Tribal Council in the first episode where a sickly man, Jim, is booted first. From there, Danny works alongside her meat shields in Brandon and Bobby John to secure the numbers going into the merge. The only problem here was was that her swapped tribe kept losing challenges at the swap and thus they kept losing numbers with Blake, Brian, and then Amy leaving. Danny had positioned herself well in the swap tribe as the smallest target, but since her tribe was going into the merge down in numbers four to six, it really wasn't going to mean anything, or was it? Come the merge, her tribe was targeted to be voted out, and so Danny quickly realized she needed to pivot away from her meat shield allies and get in good with the power players pulling the strings on the opposing alliance. See, in the history of Survivor, normally the underdogs will attempt to take out the head of the opposition, but Danny did the opposite. She bonded with the two power players of the opposing tribe, Rafe and Stephanie, and positioned herself as an important ace up their sleeve, a pocket vote they could utilize when the majority alliance would eventually need to turn on one another. When Danny's alliance was decimated, going into that final six, 
It was nothing but her versus a tribe of five. But she did win a crucial immunity at this point, which bought her time. And then she turned the power players against one of their own, sending Judd home. From here, Danny kept herself in the game by downplaying her game at the final five and the final four, as well as emphasizing how important she was as a pocket vote and a guaranteed final two for Rafe against Stephanie. Essentially, Danny's game came down to social positioning, and it worked, as she won the final three immunity and took out her biggest threat, eventually winning in a landslide 6-1 to one vote over Stephanie. The winner of Survivor Guatemala. <laughs> Next up, Season 12, Survivor Panama, Exile Island. Aris Bushkowskis. Aris, as we say, a young guy who is placed in a tribe with other young guys. Again, Survivor loves these tribe divisions by gender, but this time it's also by age. So yeah, Aris is placed in a tribe of four with three other young guys similar in age, and this tribe lasts for all of one episode. Okay, Aris does yoga, and then a tribe swap happens. He gets placed on a tribe of seven, and so he joins a majority four-person alliance alongside Shane, Danielle, and Courtney. This proved to be a tragic mistake because all of these new allies turned out to be kind of crazy. Aris also had Bobby, another guy from his previous tribe, with him, and for some reason, Aris felt the need to basically tell the two players on the bottom that they were on the bottom, the two being Suri and Melinda, and if they wanted, they could just volunteer to be voted out first. But they didn't, and Melinda left, and the craziness was just beginning. Another player who was sent to Exile Island, a guy named Bruce in the previous episode, joined Aris' tribe, the Kasayas, and now they were back to seven versus seven. The next vote, at the final 12, when Aris' tribe went to tribal council, was all over the place. Aris had become the leader of the tribe and the alliance, and he wanted Bruce to go because the guy was a bit of a nuisance, but the women on the tribe were like, nah, eh, like we don't want Bobby around, so we're gonna vote Bobby out. So in a three to two to one to one vote, yeah, that, that happened. Not even just a three, two, one, a three, two, one, one vote, Bobby left. Probably shouldn't have gotten drunk off wine in the reward latrine, but you know what? Such is life in Kasaya. What are you gonna do? So the merge hits, and Kasaya was up 6-4 to four over the opposing Lamina tribe. Now the leader of the Laminas, Terry, was sussed out by Aris to have the idol, which in this season was super powerful. It could be played after the votes were read, meaning Aris could be in hot water if Terry gave his idol to the vote getter. But thankfully Terry didn't, instead opting to keep it for himself, and one by one the Laminas left until it was just all six Kasaya versus Terry. Also, I just want to say props to Aris for deciding to fight Terry for immunity to flush his idol by choosing not to eat food. Even though Terry still won immunity here at the final eight, Aris was in the right frame of mind. At the final seven, my favorite episode in all of Survivor, Shane gets naked and Bruce gets medevaced. Not that those events had anything to do with each other per se, just they both happened. So Bruce is gone and we go onward to the final six. Another episode I have covered extensively, check out the 3 to one video talking about just this round. Suri, who is basically Aris's number one ally at this point, what a long way she has come, realizes that Courtney is a goat who can't win the game and a lot of people will take her to the end over Suri. So Suri gets herself, Aris, and Danielle to vote out Courtney. They mislead Shane to vote for Danielle, and then Terry and Courtney join together and vote out Aris, which doesn't work. Courtney goes three, two, one, bam. In the final five, Aris was now practically safe, regardless of the immunity challenge, which Terry had now won his fifth in a row, as well as holding the overpowered idol. It was either Terry or Shane who were getting votes, and on the off chance that Shane would win immunity here and Terry had to use his idol, I imagine Danielle just gets picked off instead since Suri and Aris were so tight. Aris wins immunity at final four and deigns to take Suri to the final three, but I think this would be a pretty bad idea given Suri probably beats him in the final two. Regardless, he ties the vote in Suri's favor and then she sadly loses in the fire making challenge, beginning a long running record of just barely missing out on being in front of the jury. And then finally, Terry can't play his idol at the final three, and he doesn't win immunity, and yeah, Danielle votes Terry out, taking Aris to the final two. Easy choice. And then on day 39, Aris nearly gets himself medevaced when he slips on some rocks and cuts himself with a champagne glass. 
Imagine that. Danielle wins by default. I got my butt kicked out here by the elements. I got my butt kicked by Terry Dietz a lot of the time. I got my butt kicked by my own short-sightedness falling down on the rock. Despite the fact that I made it 39 days, I feel like my ego has been crushed. I kind of came in as a buffoon, and I kind of went out as a buffoon. And in between, I did some pretty cool things. But... <laughs> That's life. But she didn't. Aris went on to win 5-2 to two over Danielle, playing a pretty decent game. Mostly, though, I just give him credit for managing to survive the Kasaya tribe for pretty much the entire season. In my books, that's a true survivor. The winner of Survivor XLI. <laughs> With season 13, Survivor Cook Islands, we have Yul Kwan. One of the most likable winners in Survivor history outside of Ethan, who's also on this season from season three. Really, Yule is beloved, and for good reason. His journey to the win was one of being the ultimate underdog, facing near impossible odds and still managing to triumph. Yule is the eternal diplomat. He's the definition of cool, calm, and collected. Jeff stated he is like the UN of Survivor. He hears everyone out, he's understanding, thoughtful, and rationalizes everything before making a move. He's very calculated, but not in like a conniving way. He was dubbed the godfather on his season, as he was the guy the players went to to make a hit. And even though Yule wasn't so comfortable being coined the godfather, he was given most of the credit for the moves made that led his alliance to reaching the final four together. Yule's victory over Ozzy, one of the greatest challenge beasts in all of Survivor, is a testament to how strong his social and strategic game was. At face value, Ozzy wins probably like 9 out of 10 seasons with the game that he played in Cook Islands or even in a later season, South Pacific, being the ultimate provider, winning a handful of immunities, overall just being a decent guy. But Yule was able to gain more respect from the jury for being the strong, calculated, deliberate mover and shaker of the game. There's a lot of craziness in Cook Islands, and I won't go through all of it to cover a synopsis, but what needs to be brought up was that Yule found the immunity idol in episode 2 and held on to it until the very end of the game, never even playing it. It was the more powerful idols we've seen before, the one where you can play them after the votes are read, so it was very much overpowered, basically an extra life in the game but he was able to leverage that idol at the final nine when his alliance of four needed a fifth vote, and Yule secured it with Penner, a man stuck in the middle of two factions. Yule didn't want to use the idol against Penner and instead wanted to work with him, have him join their side to have the majority, and he revealed his idol to Penner to encourage him to flip. And Penner did, because Yule's alliance was friendlier and more welcoming, and if Penner had to pick a winner of the lot, He'd rather see Yule win than, I don't know, someone like Parvati? Could you imagine Parvati winning? Anyway, that was Yule's biggest move. It gave him the numbers and eventually the game. Alongside giving Penner's hat back to him after he was voted out. Game changer. The winner of Survivor Cook Islands. Season 14, Survivor Fiji. Here we go, one of the best Survivor winners to date. We get the ever so lovely, and almost on Winners at War, Earl Cole, the first unanimous jury vote winner in Survivor. And he was just one vote away from playing a perfect game on paper. Damn you, Rita, and your random throwaway. Okay. Earl gets dropped into a cast that I think on paper appears to be similar to Cook Islands divided by race. But they weren't, possibly because one player quit pre-game, thus leaving the cast at 19 players. Earl had formed an early bond with several other African American players in Anthony, Dreams, and Cassandra, and also Erica, although that wouldn't last long. The tribes were not divided by race, but instead were divided by one important factor, Sylvia. And one tribe would be given riches, a nice shelter, food, while another tribe would live in squalor, nothing, barely a piss cave. Rich versus poor. Who wins? Spoiler alert, it's the rich. Like, it's not even close. Earl's Ravu tribe goes on to become the worst performing tribe in the history of Survivor to this day. They bomb hard. But Earl doesn't, forming strong bonds with pretty much everyone, a common trait amongst these winners, particularly Yao Man, but also Michelle and Anthony. 
Earl gets exiled in episode two, and thus he loses an early ally, Erica, but from there recovers when his previously mentioned allies take out Sylvia, outplaying her, Rocky, and Mookie. Also, Rita votes for Earl here, and she does it as a total throwaway vote to have Sylvia go. She doesn't want Earl to leave, but she doesn't want to vote for Sylvia either, so she votes randomly knowing Earl isn't going. This is the only time that Earl gets voted for all season. And then Earl gets his revenge and votes Rita out at the next tribal. From here, Earl is swapped to the ever so lovely Moto tribe, the rich tribe, alongside Cassandra, Yao Man, Boo, Stacy, and Michelle. And they don't go to tribal council for the entire pre merge. But Earl befriends Boo and Stacy, and now he's got his numbers going into the merge, especially given Boo was on the outs in the previous stride and Stacy was ready to jump ship. Also, fortunately, Earl helps Yao find the hidden idol, which gives us this great scene. Yao man's gonna stay behind while the five of us go. Retrieve the boat. So, this gives him a moment to look, and we'll have it. So that, that'll be our ace in the pocket. It looks good on me. It really does. I'm gonna jump out to jump off my skin here. Unfortunately, however, a really dumb one-off twist happens at the merge and Michelle gets voted off when the tribes are jumbled up for one round. Why? Producers, what did Michelle ever do to you? Regardless, merge happens, final nine, and this is a fun episode. One of the most important flips in the evolution of the game, it's basically six to three, Earl's alliance has numbers over the quote-unquote four horsemen alliance against Mookie, Alex, Edgardo, and kinda dreams, except that Earl wins over dreams and now the guy is leaking information to Earl's alliance about the location of the idol. Basically, the four horsemen have it and they're going to play it. It's just a matter of on who. They waffle between Alex and Mookie until Stacy pops up and is just like, why don't we just vote for option C, Edgardo? And thus, the safe vote strategy is born. Edgardo is blindsided and the idol is wasted and it's perfect. Following this blindside, the remaining two members get voted out, Mookie and Alex, leaving us with the final six. And this is where it gets a little dicey. Yao cuts a deal with Dreams at the reward challenge where Yao will give Dreams the car reward he just won if, in return, Dreams will give Yao Man immunity at the final four if they are both there and if Dreams wins the necklace. Dreams takes the deal and says, hey, you know what? I'll take the car. Let's just vote out Yao next. And at this point, just to sum it all up, everyone turns on Yao. But Earl votes with Yao, knowing he has an idol, and plays the idol to send Stacy packing. But it needs to be said, in spite of all of this, Earl was pretty much guaranteed final three here, at this point in the final six, by virtue of being so close with Dreams and Cassandra. There was nothing his biggest opposition, Yao, could do about it, unless, say, Yao tried to vote out uh, Dreams or Cassandra, but that just wasn't going to happen. Earl wasn't going to allow it. Earl had the numbers. Also, he too had an idol and played it at the final five, though he didn't need to. Yao won immunity at the final five, and thus, the two biggest players of the season, the two biggest jury threats, were facing off in the final four. Dreams wins immunity and is faced with a dilemma. Give Yao immunity as part of the deal and possibly get voted out losing the game, or don't and still lose the game. In the end, Dreams did lose the game and he didn't fulfill his end of the bargain. Yao gets voted out and I gotta believe Earl at least goes to fire here if Dreams does give up his immunity, but we'll never know for sure. Either way, Earl goes to the final tribal with Cassandra and Dreams and trounces them 9-0-0. First unanimous win, and in my opinion, one of the more impressive games we have ever seen in all of Survivor. Round two producers make it happen. So Earl, it's a simple question. Why would you not want to take me to the next level? The reason why I would not want to go against you, because I would not win. Thank you. The winner of Survivor Feast. <laughs> Lastly, we get to season 15, Survivor China with Todd Herzog, a flight attendant from Utah. Also a major super fan, which is a funny contrast to Earl, who I think was brought onto the season at the last minute. Todd played in perhaps the most unique location ever, China, in a very swampy, wet, bamboo-laden marsh of a camp being placed on the Fei Long tribe, and right away, Todd was in game mode. Seriously, major gamer here. 
Todd was in a dominant three-person alliance along with Amanda, the Amanda Kimmel from Survivor China, and Aaron. And in the case of Aaron, he used him as a shield to be targeted ahead of him to put Aaron in the leadership position so Todd could be hiding in the shadows calling the shots. He was also on good terms with Jean Robert, who could tell Todd was a threat, but also he needed allies because Jean Robert had a horrible social game. You then had James, who was also good with Todd, as well as Courtney, a player who didn't really seem to want to be there, but still just kind of went with it. I don't know, you know, fly me to China, I will take some spare cash. Todd also gets in good with the first person he votes off, Leslie, who helps him with finding idol clues. A lot of the twists this season involve intermingling with the opposing tribe, and getting clues is one of them. Todd seems to be in good with the other tribe too, as he gets a clue from Dave, and soon enough, Todd figures out where the idol is located, or at least the general idea. However, a real unbalanced tribe swap happens at the final 12, and Todd loses both James and Aaron, two of his closest allies, to the other tribe. And then the other tribe throws the immunity challenge and cackles gleefully in the process, and they vote out Todd's meat shield, Aaron, and Todd is pissed. So Todd gets super extra and goes into overdrive and schemes up a plan to get both idols in his alliance's possession and use one of them to blindside the other tribe in the process. Another big twist of the season in the pre-merge was kidnapping. If you win reward, you can kidnap an opposing player and bring them to your tribe for the day. So they win reward and they kidnap James, his former ally, and Todd gives James the idol he finds. Due in part because James, of course, has a clue and he brings it over and he gives it to Todd. Oh yeah, and, and Todd finds this idol along with Amanda and unintentionally frosty from the other tribe. It, it's a funny scene. Those freaking bats. So Todd gives James an idol while he's kidnapped and he wants James to throw the next immunity challenge at the final 11 and play his idol to get out Jamie or PG, the leaders of the opposing tribe. A master stroke. Okay. See what it is. Yeah. I don't know what it is. What is it? I'll tell you tomorrow. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you tomorrow. I can't open this tomorrow. You can open it tonight, but give it to me tomorrow and I will help save you. I promise. I've got a whole plan. What? Yeah. <laughs> Except, well, as ingenious as it all is, Denise blows the challenge and Todd's tribe accidentally loses the challenge by default because Denise can't finish. And just like that, poof! The plan is shot into smithereens. Are you, you giving this, up, Denise? James? Give me a break. You gotta let Denise beat you. You got this, James. Got I can't swallow it. I can't swallow it. Yeah, just shut up. No, no, no. Come on, man. James scores for John Who. Perfect plan. Genius idea. Smashed. I gotta say, as ingenious as I've said this move is. Todd ultimately goes and votes out Sharia, who was a swapped player from the other tribe, and that kind of accomplishes the same goal as his original plan, only now Todd is down an idol, or two idols, and James potentially has the other tribe's idol, Jean Hu, so Todd has some obstacles ahead that he may have created himself. But I like where his head is at, even though he's not appeasing his ally Courtney by continuously denying her the ability to vote out Jean Robert. I do believe Todd had Frosty and Sharia in his pocket at this point, but he also had Jean Robert, so it really wasn't a big loss either way, and JR was a guaranteed number that Todd could miss for the upcoming merge. Which is what happened. He entered the merge up in numbers 6-4 to four and immediately took out Jamie as she played a set piece, a piece of wood as an idol. Just keep pedaling that bike, Jamie. Jean Robert then has a stroke of genius. We should blindside James because he has the American immunity idol. Good thinking, JR. Sorta. Except Todd begins to realize, well, Todd wants to control the narrative about him being the puppet master, and with JR concocting the ideas, he might get the wrong impression that he's the puppet master too, but he isn't. So Todd puts the big bear of genres in his place, and finally appeases Courtney, only took so long, and out goes JR. From here Frosty goes, makes sense, but what about James and his idols? He has two of them, and he didn't even offer one up to Todd? Rude. Well, it's the final seven, and James has three more rounds to play them, meaning the window to take him out is rapidly closing. 
Todd knows James isn't the biggest strategist, and clearly he and Amanda have kind of kept a close watch on James all season, managed to secure his loyalty, and so Amanda believes now is the time to take out James more than ever. Todd is hesitant. What if he catches wind? What if Todd goes? But it's for naught. James doesn't play an idol, and the votes go his way, and... Arguably the biggest blindside with the highest stakes occurs here. I mean, two idols at the final seven. God, really, James? But yeah, Todd has this final four alliance on lock. Himself, Amanda, Courtney, and Denise. They pick off the outsiders in Eric and PG, and then ultimately Denise goes at the final four because she has the saddest story and probably the biggest need for the money of the four of them. And even though she's mostly just kind of coasted to the end, she still might win. It's impressive to me that Todd doesn't win a single immunity nor play an idol and yet still convincingly gets to the final three. He also gives one of the greatest final speeches in all of Survivor, probably the greatest in all of US Survivor. It's the cherry on top of his juicy road to victory and one of my favorite wins and favorite winners in the entire series. Winner of Survivor China. <laughs> Speaking of Yule winning in Survivor Cook Islands, could you just imagine if like, I don't know, Parvati won that season? Well, oh yeah, and then the next winner is in fact Parvati Shallow. From season 16, Survivor Micronesia, fans versus favorites. Perhaps Yule and Parvati chilling in a hot tub together in the Cook Islands was a prophecy. I just realized how strong I am and just what I'm capable of. When it comes down to it, if I'm just thrown into the wilderness again. I know I can survive. Parvati is one of, if not the most iconic female players in all of Survivor. 40 seasons strong now. She's played three times and she's nearly won twice, losing to Sandra in Heroes vs. Villains, but winning on her second try in Micronesia. And of course, losing to Yule in the aforementioned Cook Islands. Parvati has a lot of history with the people on season 40. She has a ridiculously high survival rate in the game and is known for making big, explosive moves, such as playing two idols at once, blindsiding a string of men who all held idols, as well as rather subtle moves, blink and you might miss them, like turning down an idol on Exile Island because she didn't really need it, or throwing the final immunity challenge in a manner somewhat similar to Richard Hatch in season one. Parvati entered Micronesia already as a big threat. Winners at War will be her third time entering a season as a major threat. Parvati was targeted out of the gate as a huge flirt, capable of manipulating the guys to do her bidding. I think we should take Parvati out first. I think Parvati is a much bigger threat as a social player than Ozzy is. That girl needs to go. She's way of just like roping people in even when they don't want anything to do with her. I'm gonna find out how to bottle that up and use it in my real life because <laughs> it's pretty powerful stuff. Except her real strength was in bonding with the women, which would later prove to be her greatest achievement. If anything, I would say Parvati's biggest move came at the swap of this season when she met two women from the opposing tribe who she instantly connected with, Natalie and Alexis. She pocketed their two votes and would then go on to rely on them in the post-merge once the most infamous alliance ever seen was formed, the Black Widow Brigade. Herself, Natalie, Alexis, Sari, and Amanda would go on a tear, blindsiding Ozzy, Jason, and Eric in a string of unprecedented blindsides. Also, Parvati assisted in Amanda using an idol to take out Alexis at the final six. Parvati pulled a lot of punches, and it was her connections with these women that gave her the win in the end, as well as her final two opponent, Amanda, just not being very good at pitching her case to the jury. Whenever a female player is strong, intelligent, and capable of playing the game really well, they often get compared to Parvati, and subsequently voted out because of it. But now the Queen P 4.0 is back to leave another mark. Having not played since season 20, half the show's lifespan ago, I could not be more excited to see what she has in store. The winner of Survivor Fans vs. Favorites, Parvati. From season 17, Gabon, Earth's Last Eden, we have your local high school science teacher, particularly that of Julie Berry. It's Bob Crowley. 
or shall we say Robert? Put some respect on his name, the man wore his buff as a bow tie. Bob entered the season back when Survivor just couldn't be bothered to create their own tribe, so they made the contestants ruin the season themselves. But no, really, the two oldest players were placed as tribe captains, and so here Bob was out of the gate in the spotlight. He was able to pick the first member of his new yellow Coda tribe, and he chose Ace. Bob is perhaps best remembered for being a kind of Survivor MacGyver. He was a forever Boy Scout who crafted all kinds of things, most notably hidden idols, but also in the premiere we saw him putting together the roof of one of the tribe's huts. Bob came off fairly likable, and I believe it's this disarming and unassuming nature, as well as being a useful contributor, that allowed him to be approached by a four-person alliance for him to jump on and be their fifth. With nine members on the tribe, this alliance held a majority as he allied himself with Marcus, Charlie, Corinne, and Jackie, and they were known as the Onion Alliance because they had layers, of which Bob was for sure the furthest from the core. Bob was happy tagging along with the majority. It was safe and it bought him more time, so why not? He also got along with these players, and so when they went to Tribal Council on day nine, they voted out Paloma a player on the outs. From here, Bob doesn't go to tribal again until the final 11, right before the presumed merge. He does get swapped onto a new tribe on day 12 alongside his fellow allies Corinne, Charlie, and Marcus, alongside the opposing tribe Fong members of Randy, Susie, and Dan. And Bob was ranked pretty highly amongst the rest of his tribe in this swap, so you know what? Good for Bob, he's clearly valued. Randy despised his previous tribe and immediately jumped ship to join the Onions. However, Bob's alliance lost a member on the other side, on the other tribe, in Jackie, which meant Bob kind of moved up a spot in the alliance hierarchy, but then when Randy showed up, Bob pretty much moved back to his original spot at number five. This meant Susie and Dan were on the bottom of the swap tribe, with both of them trying to get in good with the Onion majority. And this is where things begin to go downhill really fast. The Onions decide to split their vote between Dan and Susie in the event of an idol, since Dan could have had one given he went to Exile Island many episodes ago, and that was where idols were hidden. When Dan was voted out here four to three, it signaled to Susie loud and clear that that she was not valued by this majority, she was expendable. I really think the Onions, including Bob, should have done more than just whisper sweet nothings into her ear and then turn around and vote for her. Right after this, a second tribe swap hits at the final 10, out of the blue, at the merge, and now the two tribes are still two tribes, but each are reduced to five. Bob has Marcus and Susie, and they're also joined by Kenny and Crystal. The divide between these five is pretty clear, and Bob pretty much does not maneuver whatsoever to change what happens next. Susie turns on him and Marcus, and they vote out Marcus, clearly the bigger threat. So at the final nine, the two tribes merge, and Bob rejoins Charlie, Corinne, and Randy, and they're pitted against the other obvious alliance of Kenny, Crystal, Susie, and Maddie. This leaves Sugar in the middle, a player who was kind of all over the place. She had been sent to Exile Island five straight times and was also in possession of the actual real idol, and she was the swing vote. She ultimately chose to go with the Merry Band of Misfits, the Fong Alliance, and out went Charlie. Also, Bob went to Exile Island here and discovered the idol was missing, and thus he had no ace up his sleeve. So he managed to pull off a pretty decent move by creating a fake idol out of beads and a rock and some other random baubles he found around camp and at challenges, Bob was crafty, after all, and this was him at his prime. At the final eight, it's clear to Bob he is firmly at the bottom and in trouble. Himself, Corinne, and Randy are facing a firing squad and have no hope. Bob goes back to Exile Island and gets a sweeping helicopter shot, of course, and then back to camp, a plan is concocted. A plan to humiliate Randy his ally. Basically, the idea is that Randy decided to go nuclear to draw votes onto him, and then they would use Bob's fake idol to save Randy. The problem was that Randy believed this idol was real, and Bob went along with Randy because Sugar hated Randy and wanted to get him humiliated after he played Bob's fake 
idle. I kind of wish that in this instance, Bob could have brought Sugar over to his side and smoothed the relationship between her and Randy somehow. She did have the real idol after all, but I get it, it's never that simple. Instead, Bob burns Randy and sends him packing. Bob then creates a second fake idol, yeah, another one, at the final seven, and he does let his last ally, Corinne, in on this idea. It's a fake. I'm not humiliating you two, don't worry. Bob wins immunity so he's safe, which means he can use his fake idol to get the Fong Alliance to split their votes, and who knows, maybe something crazy happens. While I don't give too much credit to Bob for how everything pans out following this final seven vote, it needs to be said that I think Bob winning immunity and forcing a split vote to occur because of his fake idol is ultimately what paves his road to victory. The Fong split their votes and it causes infighting at the final six, but Bob wins immunity again and again, both at six and at five. He does get into a weird deal with Kenny where Kenny tries to dupe him into giving up immunity only for Kenny to then vote Bob out. Bob didn't fall for it, but it almost could have happened. At the final four, Bob failed to win immunity and it would have seemed his game was over. However, Sugar decided to tie the vote two to two to give Bob a fighting chance and he went to fire against Maddie, whom he beat. This tie vote really came down not so much to Bob doing anything, but Sugar just liking Bob enough to save him. Again, from the beginning, I said Bob had a very likable, disarming nature to him. She had recently lost her father, and she found Bob reminded her of him. So, I guess being old might be the best move made all season. At Final Tribal, Bob is sitting next to Sugar and Susie, and he's pretty much got four votes locked up with Marcus, Charlie, Corinne, and Randy, his previous Onion allies. Bob Bob has a pretty bad performance here. He admits he never had much strategy, never needed to, and I guess he was kind of right. I think the votes for him were partially against Sugar and Susie more than they were just for Bob, but hey, you know what? It's Gabon. A win's a win. When I came to Africa, I came here to experience not only Survivor, but sort of learn about myself, to really think about how lucky a person I am, what a wonderful family I have, and what a beautiful place Africa is. I see why they call it the Garden of Eden. The winner of Survivor Gabon, Bob. <laughs> Following Gabon, we have season 18 Survivor Token Sheen's The Brazilian Highlands with James Thomas, also known as JT, the good old country boy with a heart of gold and an immaculate social game. At least in this season, anyway. JT is best known in Token Sheen's for his 7-0 shutout at the final tribal against his number one ally all season in Steven and how everyone in the jury loved him to the point where some jurors even wanted him to win before they were even voted out. On day one, JT was placed on the Red Jalapau tribe, or as Sandy says, the Jalapino, Jalapun, Jal Jalapino, it's a tribe of eight, and he formed a guy's alliance with Steven, Joe, and Spencer, promising to work together. Likewise, he particularly bonded the closest with Steven, who was a city boy, and there was a fun dichotomy between the two, given JT was a country guy with a strong southern accent. JT was a physically strong provider for the group, always seemed to work hard, especially in the challenges. Heck, at one point, he lost a tooth after taking a rough dive to catch a ball. The Jalapau tribe picked off the two clear outsiders and Carolyn and Sandy first, with both tribes being tied in numbers 6-6 six to six after 4 episodes. The guys' alliance was still pretty strong, but what's more, JT's bond with Steven eventually brought Taj into the fold, making them a stronger trio. Taj held the hidden idol, and both her and Steven had a secret exile alliance with the opposing tribe, due to the tribes mingling with each other with each Exile Island visit. When the vote was flipped to Spencer in episode 5, this would pave the way for this guy's alliance to dissipate, and now JT's trio of himself, Steven, and Taj to control the vote if they went back to tribal. Which they did. The three decided to pick off the remaining outsider, Sydney, and blindsided Joe too, who believed it was Taj who was leaving. Halfway into the season, the Jalapau tribe was reduced to four members, who weren't entirely united either, but 
Then the merge hits, and suddenly Jalapau appears a lot better off than the numbers would dictate. The imposing Tumbira tribe of six was really fractured. With a trio of three, Coach, Tyson, and Debbie, a duo of two, Brandon and Sierra, and a lone wolf player in Aaron. Not to mention, JT's allies, Steven and Taj, had this secret exile alliance with Brandon and Sierra. Meanwhile, Coach wanted to form a warrior alliance with JT and Steven, and then Aaron despised everyone on her tribe. Through all of this, you kind of begin to see how JT walked right into a perfect setup to take advantage of some massive cracks. Initially, the vote was to get Brandon out and get rid of the Exile Alliance, but then Joe, an original Jalapau, was medevaced at the merge. Okay, oh well. He was on the bottom anyway, and it didn't seem to affect much going forward. Because at the next vote, JT committed himself to the Warrior Alliance, also looping in Aaron, and Brendan and Sierra were blindsided. And Coach could not have been happier. Until the next vote anyway, <laughs> where JT, Steven, and Taj made a great play by pivoting to pull in Sierra, who was now ostracized, as well as Aaron, the lone wolf. These five held the majority at eight, and another blindside hit us with Tyson going, the first episode of Survivor I ever watched live. That said, JT was in such good graces with all of the players he was turning his back on, and because they all hated each other more, and JT was just very charming, still seemed trustworthy, the remnants of the Exile Alliance and the Warrior Alliance kept crawling back his way. Credit to both JT and Steven for being the dynamic duo who controlled each vote and utilized every option. Heck, at one point, as I said earlier, JT was so well liked and so well ingratiated that after he went on a reward with Brendan, Brendan told the cameras he wants JT to win more than anything. He would be ecstatic to see the guy take home the money. I had a, a really good day. I mean, it was a lot better than I had pictured. Uh, you know, I figured Brendan and I being together would kind of be a dull trip. Um, but it wasn't a dull moment at all. If he wins it, that's like me winning this game. How do I get him to the finals? I don't know. This is the next step I need to wrap my head around. Let's have some fun. At the final six, JT and Steven decided they had two final three deals in place. Might as well just cut ties with the remnants of Timbira, and so they voted out Debbie and then Coach. But before I get to the very end, it needs to be said that JT goes on an immunity streak starting at the final five, winning out the rest of the season, but Steven, JT's number one ally, very much did not intend to take JT to the finals if he had the choice. Steven knew how likable JT was, and so when the time came, Steven would blindside JT too. But yeah, the time never came, and I don't think Steven made any wrong choices here either. He had set himself up well enough to win had JT just not won immunity so deep, but hey, such is life. Meanwhile, JT was buttering up the jury, even voting to keep Coach at the final five just to save a pact he had made with the guy, instead painting Steven as the villain in the Warrior Alliance who turned. Steven... <sighs> At the final four, Taj had to be cut as she was a bigger threat to win than Aaron, and at this point, JT was planning to take Steven to the final two regardless. He knew he had the game on lock if he could just get there. And yeah, JT cuts Aaron at the final three and gives a great performance at the final tribal, although he kind of puts on a bit of an act, kind of like Chris from Vanuatu, in that he totally embellished some points to further his case. He admits to it at the reunion, he wasn't really that hurt that Steven would cut him, it's a game after all, but still, you know what? Good on JT for giving the jury what they wanted to hear, as he went on to get every single juror vote, winning 7-0, only the second player ever to sweep the jury in Survivor history. Go out on a high note. The winner of Survivor yeah! Yeah! Thank you. So now, let's get to season 19, Survivor Samoa, with Natalie White, easily the most invisible, under the radar, unseen winner in Survivor history. Yes, not even the edge of extinction can rob Natalie of that title. Natalie was a young southern woman who arrived on the beaches of Samoa, placed in the yellow Foa Foa tribe of 10, and right away on day one, she made arguably the greatest alliance of the season when she was approached by Russell to make a final two pact to the end. She agreed and she fell in line. This would be their secret little deal. Except that Russell also went and did the same thing with like half the tribe, but still, Natalie's in the end proved to be the most important. Despite the fact that Natalie's tribe goes to tribal council a lot in this pre-merge, losing six out of 10 players before the merge, 
Natalie really doesn't get a chance to tell us much about what she's up to, or if she is actually up to anything. We know she's in an alliance with Russell. We know she plans to take Russell to the end because she believes that she can beat him. She recognizes that she is going to be a social player. She can form bonds with the rest of the tribe while Russell might just burn those same bridges. Through a lot of adversity in the pre-merge, Natalie outlasts six of her tribe mates entering the merge alongside Russell, Mick, and Jason against eight members of the opposing Galoo tribe. No winner and survivor had ever had the numbers so heavily stacked against them. And given there was no swap, she was pretty much meeting all of them for the first time. And yet, despite that, Natalie bonded well with the women, particularly Laura, over their religion, as well as Kelly and Monica. The Galoo tribe had a split between the men and the women, and infighting was happening, and Natalie floated the idea to pick off Eric first, a Galoo man, who would lead the charge against the women of Galoo when the numbers thinned. Eric was blindsided, and this would prove to be the beginning of the end for Galoo. But first, needs to be said, Natalie kills a rat. Oh yeah. True character development. Winners edit anyone? From here, she remains loyal to her Foa Foa allies and absolutely relies on Russell to play his second idol correctly, which he does, and the four of them blindside Kelly, now putting the numbers at six to four. Likewise, Shambo had successfully been flipped at this point, credit to Russell too for stoking that flame, and really, the numbers were now five to five. At the final 10, the five true Galoo all voted for Natalie, and while I don't know exactly why they did that, I'm guessing it was either because she was least likely to have an idol played on her, or, or find an idol, or because Galoo expected to go to rocks and wanted Natalie to be safe. I'm not 100% sure, but she does receive five votes from them. Regardless of why they did that, John flips on Galoo just like Shambo did, and now the Foa Foa 4 had taken control. Where they entered the merge down 8 to 4, they now ruled the roost and continued to vote off the remaining Galoo, removing John, Dave, and Monica. At the final six, Natalie was the tribe captain for a coconut reward challenge, and she was able to pick her team of three, and she chose Brett and Mick. And while this wasn't a major game-changing move, I want to point out that she did this because if her team won reward, it would fuel Mick, the strongest guy left in their alliance, who could beat Brett, the last remaining true Galoo, at the next immunity challenge, or if her team lost, Brett wouldn't get any food, which would weaken him. I found this little detail a nice nod in the direction of where her head was, because a majority of the editing this season just doesn't tell us her story at all, and we're kind of left to figure it out in the cracks of the bigger picture. And so, Shambo goes at the final six, because Brett is basically Mike Tyson. Winning immunities left and right. He wins the final five immunity, and he is a slam dunk to win the jury if he gets there Everyone loves the guy, he was true galoo to the end, and again, juries reward the players they like the most. Brett was pretty likable, despite being even less visible to us than Natalie, nearly CGI if I'm being honest. So Natalie and Russell needed Brett to go, and they voted out Jason because Mick was their best bet. But it didn't matter, as Russell ended up beating Brett at Final Four, and even though Natalie had spent time bonding with Brett through this endgame, she openly told him, yeah, sorry man. You gotta go. It's pretty obvious why. Because the final three consisted of all Foa Foa, it was Natalie, Russell, and Mick, and the jury was mostly Galoo, all three finalists shared a similar trajectory to get there. I think there may be a little bit of strategy involved to Russell making us feel like we're not gonna win or that we don't have a chance, but I have uh, news for him. I'm not gonna give up, and I'll just explain to the jury, I don't work the same way as Russell. That would clearly not have worked for me. The girls that were aggressive, they got eliminated early. My strategy was to be myself and at the end of the day, you know, I wasn't out to get anybody or make anybody look bad. Russell made it clear he was okay with making people look bad. And I gotta say that the Samoa jury is one of my favorites to dissect because I've heard a lot of different stories from their side. For example, going into this final tribal, I have heard that it was Mick who may have been the favorite to win, but the problem was during the final tribal, Mick just didn't own his leadership. He, he didn't speak with any conviction. Despite being labeled as the Foa Foa leader on day one, he instead slinked into the shadows and just kind of acted feckless or lacking in strength of character, which really made this a final two between Natalie and Russell. 
And from the sound of it, while a few jurors voted for Russell to win, particularly Shambo and John, the other seven decided all to vote for Natalie. Perhaps she was the least disliked player of this final three. She also was definitely the underdog in stature and wasn't one to boast about her accomplishments. Perhaps she was understated, as we saw one juror rally to her side and kind of give her a voice that she kind of needed and plead to the rest of the jury to see that her game was just as valuable as the other two. Many say that Natalie won because the jury here was voting against Russell and Natalie was the best option left. And while I can kind of see that argument holding water, I would also argue that being the least disliked as well as maintaining positive relationships from the moment of the merge on is a totally viable way to win. Natalie pleaded her case, owned what she could, and ultimately presented herself as the best option of the three. Perhaps half of this jury was the big bad B word, bitter, at the outcome and the makeup of this final tribal. But then I would argue bitterness is a totally valid element in the rationale to vote for someone to win a million dollars. And I don't know if Russell lost because the jury here were upset at his gameplay so much as it was his behavior and his attitude. And then it kind of begs the question, is your behavior and your attitude and the way you treat people actually a part of gameplay? Is blindsides and idle finds and big flips and votes enough to secure a jury vote? I would say it probably isn't. In the end, Natalie won not because she played the most tactical game or physically dominant game out there, clearly, but because she fostered the best relationships of the three players eligible to receive votes. Simple as that. The winner of Survivor Samoa. Sandra later returned to season 20, Survivor Heroes vs. Villains, as she was placed on the Villains Tribe. Right away, she formed a strong bond with Boston Rob, the kingpin of the tribe, and was brought into the fold of a majority alliance of six, consisting of herself, Rob, Tyson, Courtney, Coach, and Jerry. However, after a serious blunder by Tyson at the final 15, her alliance was dismantled as Tyson and then Rob were voted out back to back. She pitted herself against a new variant of Johnny Fairplay from Pearl Islands, this time being Russell Hance. Russell was the new big bad guy of the survivor world, and similar to Fairplay, Sandra was directly opposing him at every point in the season. The rivalry would become the underlying focal point of tension amongst both the villains tribe and the Merge Tribe. Sandra's best move was at this point in the season. I actually spoke about this in my first ever video. She managed to buy time for both herself and her number one ally, Courtney, by tricking Russell into voting out Coach over either of them. Because Coach was voted out here at the final 12 and there was only one more elimination before the Merge, Sandra just needed to survive one more vote to reach the individual portion of the game and that's what happened. Courtney was taken out next, but then the merge hit and Sandra was ready to join the opposing hero's tribe given she was an outsider on the villain's tribe. But she couldn't rely on the heroes to make a smart move, ingratiate her into their mix. There were a lot of problems with that tribe and so she decided to stick with the villains in hopes a crack may form in the future. The heroes were a hot mess. They lost the numbers at the merge thanks to a fantastic double idol play by Parvati. And ultimately what needs to be said here is that Sandra formed a strong bond with Parvati and decided it was in her best interest to go to the end with her. At some point in the post-merge, there was a shift where Sandra went from wanting to take Russell out to realizing she was a shoe in to beat him. He was underestimating her and wanted to take her to the end and she was going to beat him there. And that's what happens. That's the biggest thing to take away from the end game on heroes versus villains. She chose to position herself against Russell, but not to ever vote him out. She let him sink his own ship and have Parvati go down with him. And in many cases, that's more than enough to win. The winner of Survivor Heroes vs. Villains. She beat Parvati, a fellow winner on Winners at War, in a six to three vote and would later return for season 34, Survivor Game Changers, where she got voted out for the first time ever after an unlucky swap put her at a numbers disadvantage. And then she also returned alongside Boston Rob for season 39, Island of the Idols, as a mentor and a twist to help educate new players on how to succeed in the game. And then of course the winner never met her until the final five, but hey, what are you gonna do? Season 21, Survivor Nicaragua. On the heels of Heroes vs. Villains, 
This road is going to be going in a lot of directions. We got the youngest survivor winner to date, Judson Birza, better known as Fabio, because he kind of looked like Fabio. Nicaragua was split between two tribes, a tribe of 10 young players, 30 and under, and a tribe of 10 older players who were 40 and over. Because anyone else in between would just be way too confusing for the audience. Are they, are they young? Are they old? Who knows? Fabio was initially aligned with Shannon, Chase, Benry, Alina, and Kelly B. This gave them a six-person majority of the 10. However, these numbers didn't even hold for a single vote, as this group intended to vote for Brenda, who was close to Chase, and so Chase flipped on them, at which point the numbers just fell apart. Shannon was targeted immediately for being the loudest, amongst other reasons. From here on out, Fabio would stay at the bottom for pretty much the entire season. Similar to Bob, half the time Fabio was in with the majority, but he was never in control, driving a vote, and would always be targeted down the line when the numbers thinned. But regardless of how poorly positioned he was, one of the best parts about Fabio was just simply how much he enjoyed his survivor life. The guy was always laughing, always in a positive state of mind, always cracking jokes and playing the role of the fool. He didn't mind taking it on the chin, appearing as the dumb blonde who accidentally inhaled smoke or got snipped by a crab or peed in the pool or gosh, <laughs> the list goes on. That said, Fabio did have a rivalry with the biggest antagonist on the season, Nayanka. Nay, just, Nay didn't like Fabio, straight up. Just didn't like him. He was too much of a fool for her taste. But go figure, she inadvertently plays a huge part in him winning. I love situational irony. Fabio doesn't attend many tribals in the pre-merge, but he does get swapped into a majority position with fellow LaFleur tribe mates who control the numbers for the swapped portion of the game. Not to mention the Espada older tribe has a lot of division, particularly between Marty and Jane. And so even though Fabio was at the bottom of this big LaFleur alliance, he was never in trouble. Although his early ally Kelly B was sniped due to an idle deal that Fabio really didn't have much to do with. Really, Fabio doesn't have much to do with any of the vote outs this season. He's just, he's kind of there. So already we get to the merge and Fabio jumps on the dog pile to take out Alina. The early LaFleur tribe divisions are running deep and now he is totally just a hanger on, a number for the bigger group. So Fabio joins a resistance in episode nine when 11 people were remaining and he teams up with Marty, Dan and Benry to vote out Jane. Fabio believed he would have Sash on board. They all went on a cool reward trip together and it felt like a new alliance was forming and with Sash came power in numbers as Sash was running the game. But it didn't work out. Go figure. And Marty left. Thankfully, out of the blue, the big alliance decided to turn on one another in the next vote. But first, another reward trip, Fabio went sliding down a volcano. If you notice, this entry is more just about all the fun and cool things Fabio got to do in Nicaragua for 39 days, which I'm sure he wouldn't have any other way. The majority alliance trimmed their numbers and turned on Brenda, another strong player who was usually on top, but for this one vote just happened to fall to the wayside. Following this move, a major stroke of luck occurred for Fabio when both Nayanka and Purple Kelly quit the game back to back in the same episode. Both were just fed up with playing the game and the harsh weather conditions. This put Fabio from being on the bottom at the final nine to now being at the bottom in the final seven. Improvement. The last time Fabio would be up for getting voted out would be at the final seven, when it came down to either voting out him or Benry, Fabio's ally. The main alliance of four, Sash, Chase, Holly, and Jane, decided to take out Benry as he was more devious. A vote I believe several players would soon regret, as Fabio goes on an immunity streak from this point onward, winning the final six, five and four immunities to put himself in the final tribal. And I personally love this ending, if only because it is entirely focused on how this majority alliance trips over each other and basically fumble the ball into their own end zone. Meanwhile, Fabio is already there just waiting to pick it up and score. On a scale of one to 10, I am about a 10 right now. It took me 38 days to finally get into a powerful position, but now I'm finally here. Sash goes, I'd be honored if you guys to be my wingman. I was like, Sash, dude, you can take a back seat. I'll let you take notes on how this is gonna go, because it's gonna be fun. We see all the reasons why both Sash and Chase likely won't or can't win, and then they sit next to Fabio at the final three and 
Huzzah! <laughs> Neither of them win. He comes across as very likable and again, kind of like Bob, quite disarming. He's a goofball and he owns it. He also gets really emotional talking about what this meant for him and his family and how much seeing his mom at the family reward gave him that extra bit of energy to get to this point and win those final three immunities. And yeah, Fabio wins by a razor thin vote of five to four over Chase getting his winning vote from Nayanka of all people. Despite Nay working with Chase all season, she still turned around at the very end and gave her arch nemesis a tip of the cap. Hey, falling backwards into a victory is still a victory. The winner of Survivor, Nicaragua. Fabio. Our next winner is very recent and relevant to the modern game. It's Boston Rob Mariano from Season 22, Survivor Redemption Island. Now, despite Season 22 being quite a while ago, Rob did return for Season 39 just recently as a mentor alongside Sandra. And so he's been very much in the public eye over the past year. That said, his winning game is widely considered one of the strongest and most dominant wins in Survivor history, and it cemented him as one of the best players to ever play. Which is also why I think he may be in trouble this time around, but I will save those thoughts for another video. Rob has played Survivor a lot. He played as a spry young lad in season four, but was voted off at the merge. He returned in All Stars, but of course he lost to his future wife, Amber. And he returned in Heroes vs. Villains, but was taken out largely thanks to another future winner, Tyson, making a big strategic error. But Rob returned once more in Redemption Island as a captain player. He and Russell Hance, another returning player, each helmed a tribe full of new players, as this was a season largely circling the two players' rivalry. Rob was adored by his tribe, and they all looked up to him as his veteran. He was like a survivor hero in their eyes, and the Boston charm came out in full effect. He led his tribe in like a crash course in how to wreck shop, except Little did they know, they were not just his students, but also his soon-to-be victims. He found idols, led fantastic blindsides, and of course, routed the opposing tribe at the merge and route to a very surefire win in the final three. It was a no-brainer of a result, but it was nonetheless impressive to see how commanding one player could be. In my opinion, Rob's greatest move was at the merge, where he entered the halfway point of the season up in numbers seven to five. However, his number seven was shaky and could have flipped. So Rob took his strong six and he put all of their votes on the number seventh guy in their alliance and the opposing five on the other side just voted for whoever. It didn't really matter. In a six to five to one vote with an opposing idol wasted to boot, Rob secured his numbers, guaranteed a final six death march and ultimately impressed the rest of the cast so much in one fell swoop. Rob is one of the most powerful players in Survivor history. He's nearly won twice, if not for one vote, that he lost to his wife. Some may decry it took him four times to win, but I say that sample size is so low it's kind of irrelevant. And one in four is pretty dang good given the field. The results don't lie, but Rob does. But will the other winners overlook his ways or snuff his torch before his little bee hat can get any momentum? The winner of Survivor Redemption Island, Rob. If there was ever a most straightforward path to victory for a winner, the winner of season 23, Survivor South Pacific, may have taken it. Sophie Clark, the know-it-all, who clearly did, in this case, know-it-all, won quite handily in the end as she turned the season on its head by being the only sane woman in a world gone completely mad. What happens when you find yourself fully situated in an alliance full of religious people and you yourself are anything but? Well. You get down on one knee and you pray to baby Jesus because Lord have mercy, a million dollars is worth a shot to your core values if only for the next month. No, okay, but really, Sophie found herself in a dominant five-person alliance out of the gate between Coach, Rick, Albert, Brandon, and herself. Also known as the acronym CRABS. Legit. And she rode that workhorse to the very end. The pre-merge was all about her working in a trio of Coach, herself, and Albert within the five-person alliance picking off the outsiders, and then gaining the numbers at the merge by flipping Cochran, 
the superfan who was desperately on the outs from the other tribe. Once Sophie's alliance had the numbers, it was smooth sailing to the end. Arguably, I would say that her biggest move, other than you know maybe undermining Coach at the final tribal council, was just keeping her number one ally, Albert, in check. Albert consistently wanted to entertain the outsiders into making a big move, but Sophie shut that rhetoric down again and again. Because she didn't need big moves to win, she was at the top and nobody seemed to notice, and so why rock the boat when the waters are perfectly clear? By keeping Albert in check, she took out the opposing tribe, then picked off the outsiders of her own alliance, and then sat in the final three with the two people she intended to from very early on. And she beat them. Oh yeah, and she also beat Ozzy in the final immunity challenge. Who does that? Say a prayer to baby Jesus, Sophie gosh damn Clark does. What is that, like five Hail Marys for me? Anyway, Sophie, very apt, intelligent, she's good at fading into the background, doesn't need to be the loudest voice in the room, but also is really smart and smart enough to have her voice heard. And there's always space for those kinds of players in a cast full of winners. The winner of Survivor South Pacific, Sophie. But now we get to season 24, Survivor One World, with arguably the strongest winner in Survivor history. I've certainly argued this before, Kim Spradlin played the most dominant game ever, and so to have her back is nothing shy of the GOAT, greatest of all time, coming back one more time. I fully expect Kim's reputation to precede her, which is fine because she's already done her job once. Kim played in a season divided by gender. The producers put everyone in the cast on one beach and decided to see what would happen instead of giving them two separate camps. As it turns out, not much happened, but that's okay. Kim formed an early five person majority alliance similar to Sophie from the previous season and controlled the early game like it was a piece of cake. In fact, she only went to tribal council once where her alliance completely controlled the vote. After that, Kim did not return to tribal until the merge at the final 12. That said, an important tribe swap happened when 14 players were left and Kim was able to form cross tribal bonds with some of the men. Together, her new tribe formed a tight alliance, so when she went into the merge, she had numbers on every side, from her original women's alliance as well as with her newly minted mixed gender alliance. And this was when the game got interesting for Kim. Suddenly, she had options. Lots of options. Options to the left, options to the right. She even had options for her options. Kim was at the center of everything, having way more numbers than she needed. She initially took out an opposing man that she didn't align with, and from there made her biggest move of the game when she used her mixed gender alliance to turn on another man at the final 11. She pitted the men against one another, which led to them taking each other out. Eventually, the men that she was working with were catching on. Wait a minute, where'd all the dudes go? But by that point, it was too late. Kim had chosen to go with the women instead of the men. Not even an idol or laying claim to the island could save them as they were basically routed from the game, all thanks to Kim. The crazy part here is that even after controlling a lot of this, Kim still was in everyone else's endgame plans. Kat, Chelsea, Sabrina, Alicia, Christina, they were all taking Kim to the end. They viewed her as a key ally. Kim was so likable and charming, disarming, and just easy to work with, she still had the pick of the litter and plenty of options for who to crush at the final tribal council. So she picked a few of the women, beat them 8 to 1, and yep, that was it. She crushed them with kindness. And let's face it, if you're going to get taken out in Survivor, getting crushed by Kim's kindness isn't such a bad way to go. The winner of Survivor won. Yeah! Yeah. But finally, for part two, we get to one of my favorite winners, one with arguably the greatest story in all of Survivor. A story that was birthed through the natural state of the game. It's season 25, Survivor Philippines, and it's Denise Stapley, the only winner to attend every single tribal council on her season and still never get voted out. If that's not damn impressive, I think we'll need to redefine what it takes to be impressed. 
It's impressive. Denise was a part of one of the most infamous tribes in all of Survivor, the Blue Matsing tribe. They're infamous because of how bad they were at challenges. In a season with three starting tribes of six, Matt Singh lost four straight immunity challenges in a row. And this tribe had a lot of fit players like Denise herself, Malcolm, and Russell Swan, a returning player captain. So Denise forms a really strong bond with Malcolm, and together the two of them run this tribe in spite of it sinking as fast as it can. Everyone but Malcolm and Denise get voted out, and suddenly they're the only two players left, while the other two tribes have yet to visit tribal council. Because of how bad this tribe was, Malcolm and Denise then get split up and are put on separate tribes, and you would think this should probably be their end, right? They're impossibly outnumbered, and there's no way they wouldn't be the first boots on their new tribes with players they've never met before. Well, ladies and gents, this is where legends are born. In the face of severe adversity, Denise and Malcolm not only overcome this deficit, but manage to outlast almost every player on the season as they power through all the way to the final four together. What, what? That's what's up. They do find allies throughout the post-merge, but really, in spite of all the craziness, it's just... It's crazy to me that the two of them make it so far. It's very much the story of from zero to hero. Either way, Malcolm was a slightly bigger threat than Denise to win, and so Denise was able to sit in the final tribal and easily plead her case for that win, which she did, and she won rather handily. She was steadfast, composed, mindful, thoughtful, and a great speaker. I always got the impression Denise was very deliberate with her actions, except for maybe when she was faced with the firecracker Brazilian dragon, Abby Maria. Regardless, Denise is the personification of a triumphant underdog story, and now she's back to kick a little more ass. The winner of Survivor Philippines, Denise. We have Season 26, Survivor Karamoan, Fans vs. Favorites 2. Featuring 10 returning players, a lot of our favorites, and 10 fans of the show, all recruited at a local LA bar. Yep, the stage was half set for an epic showdown to rival that of Micronesia. But uh, no really, John Cochran is a super fan of Survivor. He is the winner of this season, and he lost in his first season three seasons prior, 23 South Pacific, and he was unique enough to get a second chance. Cochran reconnected quickly with a fellow tribe mate from his first season, Dawn, and they formed a strong duo that would last them the entire season. They basically worked together for all 39 days in tandem and both reached the final three, so in some ways, this is going to be the journey for the both of them, even though Cochran is the one who ends up receiving all eight jury votes while Dawn gets zero. Straight away, Cochran and Dawn found themselves in the middle of the favorites tribe between two warring factions. On one side, you had Corinne, Malcolm, Philip, and Andrea, and on the other, you had Francesca, Brandon, Brenda, and Eric. Cochran and Dawn were able to choose the direction of the game, and ultimately they decided to go with Philip, who was leading the newly minted Stealth R Us 2.0 alliance, reforming and carrying the torch from Redemption Island. This alliance would go on to run the game in pretty much every facet, the pre-swap, the post-swap, and the merge, with Cochran at the core. He was nicknamed the Intelligentsia Attaché, an academic elite, while Dawn was True Grit. With Francesca kicking rocks and going first from here, Brandon then rage quits because Philip was pissing him off, and then the swap happened with Cochran being placed alongside Dawn and Philip and Corinne in a majority position against three fans. With the numbers intact, all allies of Cochran's, these four picked off two of the fans en route to the merge. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, but that's what happens. It's a straightforward series of votes. However, we do have a civil war brewing in Stealth R Us, and once we get to the merge, we're going to see it completely fall apart. The merge of Karamoan is when the season, in my opinion, gets really interesting and starts to get spicy. First off, Cochran breaks out his inner challenge beast and wins immunity. Stealth R Us held a clear majority, as both Brenda and Eric, two initial outsiders, were looped in by this point. They held an 8-4 lead, but... Unlike a different purple tribe at the merge, they didn't totally blow it. The four fans remaining on the minority were split, and Corinne and Malcolm decided to join the outsiders to form a new majority, overthrowing Philip. 
A lot of craziness goes down here, and Cochrane is kind of just like a steady Eddie through all of it, as Corinne approaches Dawn to flip on Philip. But she plays the spoiler, Dawn plays the spoiler, and doesn't, alongside Cochrane, who also sticks with Philip. Together, they loop in Sherry, one of the fans at the very bottom, and they take out Corinne, followed by Michael. And then we get the 4th of July, we get fireworks, and we get Malcolm singing the national anthem. Three guys on the bottom, the three amigos, Malcolm, Reynolds, and Eddie, held two idols and the immunity necklace. They played both of their idols at the final 10 and they told everyone to vote for Philip because they were. Cochran held firm and still voted for Malcolm, but Philip still went and now without any idols in a six to three majority, Cochran and company split the vote on the Amigos at the final nine and proceeded to send both Malcolm and then Reynolds out the door. With one remaining player perceived to be on the bottom, Eddie, Cochrane's alliance decided to get clever, picking off their own allies who they were now putting on the bottom. Andrea had an idol, and so the remaining stealth members decided to blindside her. And then Cochrane and Dawn turn around at the final six, they loop in Sherry, one of the last two remaining fans, and pulled off a 3-2-1 to two to one vote on Brenda, another big threat to win. Cochrane always held this comedic, twisted grin where he knows what he wants to do is gonna be vicious, but he also recognizes it's probably the best move to make, and ultimately this is a game where you gotta make moves to position yourself to win. He brings up this blind sight on Brenda to both Sherry and Dawn, and thus they fool Eric and Brenda to pick off Eddie, the same mistake Andrea had just fallen for in the previous round. Gotta be one step ahead. Unfortunately from here, Eric was medevaced at the final five right after Brenda was voted out as they were making their way back to camp. And then Cochran continued his newfound challenge prowess in the final four by winning both of the final four reward and immunity challenges, cementing himself in the final three alongside Dawn, his number one ally all game, and Sherry. He puts up one of the best final tribal performances, really exudes humility with a humble demeanor, expressing how much being here means to him as a huge super fan of the show, and he just owns his game why he did what he did, and why he deserves to win. This is the culmination of 13 years of passion for Survivor, half my life. In high school, I used to wear a buff every night that Survivor was on. I used to pass out a newsletter. I wrote a paper about it in law school. This is an obsession. Between Sherry kind of being a bump on a log, especially for the second half of the season, to Dawn not seeming sincere half the time, Cochran won all eight jury votes and pulled off the second perfect game in Survivor history after JT by never having his name written down all season. Looks like flipping on his alliance to avoid drawing a rock paid off after all. The winner of Survivor fans versus favorites, Cochran. Family. Yes, Cochran is going to Let's jump right in and talk about Tyson from season 27, Blood versus water. Blood vs. Water was a season that implemented a new casting twist. Half the cast was returning players, half were new players, but the big catch was that the new players were all related to the returning players in some way. Parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses, maybe even a little bit of everything. Wait, what? It all added a new layer of complexity to the game never seen before. When you win a challenge and the person you love most in this world may get voted off because of it, Suddenly winning isn't such a fun moment now, is it? Tyson entered the game for his third time, the previous two games being season 18 and then season 20. Both of those seasons did not go that well for Tyson. He was blindsided twice, one of them largely thanks to his own doing, but now he was back and ready to take it easy. He arrived on the beaches with his girlfriend, his now wife, Rachel, and he was mostly there for her to experience Survivor, not so much himself. Of course, then she was voted out in like episode two and suddenly it got real personal real quick. Tyson was not happy about that. And all right, you guys asked for it. Time to open up a can of whoop ass and all y'all. See, here's the thing about Tyson. He's very good at many things, or at least he likes to say that he is. He comes across as cocky and arrogant, full of himself. He has a very dry, sarcastic sense of humor. He is very irreverent. One of my favorite character traits, and he's also very self-aware. Tyson loves to talk the talk, but then in this season, season 27, Go figure, he wins, so perhaps it's justified. It's one thing to talk a big game, it's another to dominate, control the season from in front, and then win. So yes, he is very cocky, but I personally prefer that 
because someone needs to be that. Someone needs to own their skill level when they actually are as good as they say. Plus, it's always fun to have one of those types of villains or anti-heroes, so I'm all for it. You do have to do a certain amount of work or appear to be working so that people just don't pay to you as the lazy guy. I don't think I'm painted as the lazy guy yet because after I crack a coconut and drink half of it, I pass the rest around to the other five people to share. So that's kind of generous of me to do. Tyson's hubris can be his own weakness, as we saw in his first two outings. But once his girlfriend was voted out in episode two, everything shifted and Tyson got serious. The pre-merge of this season doesn't really have much to mention. Tyson did have a strong pre-game connection with several returning players such as Aris, Tina, Jervis, and their loved ones, which helped keep them all alive to the merge. But at the merge, Tyson was in the driver's seat at a major crossroads and he decided to make his bed pivot and deviate from the expected and turn on those major allies of his in Aris and Tina. He formed a core three with Jervis and Monica Culpepper, and together the three of them picked off their fellow returning players, including getting one player to vote out their own mother and route to the end game. Tyson worked alongside some of the newer players and rallied the singles or the players who had all lost their loved ones earlier in the season. And it all came to a head when at the final six, the three new players banded together to force Tyson to draw a rock for his own survival due to a deadlock 3-3 tie. Tyson did have an idol in his pocket and he could have played it to ensure his safety, but he decided to take his chances and draw a rock. The first time a rock was drawn since season four and he lucked out. Once Tyson drew that rock and he survived, the season was basically his. He was the leader of the dominant alliance, he held all of the cards and his two allies were seen as followers. And what do you know? It looks like the guy who basically voted himself out seven seasons prior was actually following through on his tall order after all. <laughs> the winner of Survivor Blood vs. Wild, Tyson. <laughs> With season 28 Survivor Kageon, the tribes were split into three. Brains versus Brawn versus Beauty. Or like... I don't know, strategic versus physical versus social? Whatever, it, it didn't really mean that much anyway. Tony won that season and he was from the Braun tribe. Although amusingly, he never won a single individual immunity challenge all season. He's really not a physical threat. You may not beat him with these, but you can always beat him with these. I was pointing to my bicep and then my brain. Anyway, Tony is a bottle of crazy. He's regarded as the unicorn of Survivor winners because of how over the top and wild and different he is to most others. To start, Tony's a cop, but he lied about his profession and said that he was a construction worker. Then, also in the premiere, he begins to run around the jungle only to then find an idol. He also builds small shelters for one next to the water well so he can eavesdrop on other players. He called it his spy shack. Tony would regularly lie about all kinds of things to get ahead in the game. He lied on his own family members, his profession, what kind of advantages he had, but Tony was also really clever with his lies. While Winners at War was filming in mid-2019, I made a four-part video series discussing the 20 most ingenious moves made by Survivor winners, and go figure, Tony took up three spots, the most of any winner. He is a mad scientist of a player, which also means his target going into season 40 will be pretty big. He did return to play again on season 34, but he was voted out right away because nobody had time for his spy bunker. But in season 28, Kageon, Tony formed a strong alliance with two key players, Trish and Sarah. With Sarah, they were known as Cops Are Us, both tongue-in-cheek and quite literal, and they vowed to reach the end together. Tony's tribe never went to tribal until the swap, where he was never in danger of leaving anyway, but he chose to blindside his former Brawn members to make allies with the new beauty tribe players LJ and Jeffra. Going into the merge, Tony thought he may have the numbers if Sarah were to join his new alliance of five, making her the sixth in a tribe out of 11. But Sarah wasn't interested in working with Tony anymore. She had her new swap tribe to handle, and so instead Trish, Tony's number one ally, managed to pull Cass, a member in the opposing alliance, to their side, replacing the position Sarah would have been in. To make matters even more interesting, despite the fact that Cass was working with Sarah, 
Cass also didn't like her and wanted to vote her out, which was what Trish was promising. So together they did that, blindsetting Sarah at the merge in one of the most entertaining tribals in Survivor history. But from Sarah's blindside, Tony was in complete control. He had a 6-4 to four majority and began to make a series of ping pong like moves bouncing between working with his own alliance and then blindsiding them. But he also found a second idol. This one was even more powerful as it could be played after the votes were read, which meant Tony was really sitting pretty. He constantly threatened other players with his bag of tricks, saying how he would open it up and whip things out if they dared to make a move against him. And then it's gonna be in with the new Jeff, new special one. Right here, five people left, I have to use it. And then my special one, I have another surprise for them when I use this idol, Jeff that I won't disclose that either as of now. But ultimately, Tony fashioned the season with a boot order that he desired, even if his reasons were spontaneous, like being threatened by an all-girls alliance out of the blue. At the final five, Tony had to blindside Trish to take players to the end that he thought he stood a better chance at beating. And he was right in doing so, because by the final three, he was next to two players he was guaranteed to beat, assuming he could reach the final two. Arguably one of the best moves in Survivor, Tony convinced Wu, a former Braun member and a close ally of Tony's, to take him to the final tribal, to the final two, over Cass, a player Wu stood a much better chance at beating. Wu won that final immunity, and it was his choice who to take. Take Cass, probably win, or take Tony, definitely lose. He took Tony, and the L, and the rest is history. The winner of Survivor Kageyama, Tony! With season 29, Survivor San Juan del Sur, we saw the return of the blood versus water twist from two seasons prior. But this time, there were no returning players, just 20 new players, each of them competing against their loved one. In the winner's case, Natalie Anderson, she was playing alongside her identical twin, her 20, Nadia. Well, Saying she was playing alongside her is a bit of a stretch, given they were split into opposing tribes right away, and then Nadia was voted out in the first episode. And unlike the first Blood vs. Water, there was no Redemption Island. In true Survivor fashion, Nadia was just gone three days in. Natalie formed a strong bond with Jeremy, a firefighter, and given Jeremy's wife was voted out right after Natalie's twin, the two of them became attached to the hip. Natalie was loud and outspoken. She has a fire in her that makes her really fun to watch. She's not afraid to make big moves, but ones with substance behind them, not just for like the sake of it. The only time Nat visited Tribal Council in the pre-merge was when she assisted in blindsiding the biggest badass the game had ever seen, Drew Christie, after he threw a challenge to take out their tribe mate Kelly. Instead of letting Drew get his way, Natalie and the girls blindsided him and <laughs> it was incredible. Going into the merge, Natalie was in a tenuous position, rallying next to Jeremy, believing that she was in the majority. The vote went back and forth for several episodes, but ultimately Natalie appeared to be on the right side. Her alliance took control in a close 6-5 to five vote. Except, some of her allies then flipped in the next vote at the final 10 and blindsided Jeremy, her number one ally. Natalie was burned hard by the people that she trusted most, particularly John, and from here her story was one of retribution and revenge. She laid low and she played dumb, convincing the allies who just blindsided her that she was still good, you know, it's no problem. Yeah, you voted out my number one, but that's okay, it's no big deal. I mean, I think I sold it to them properly, but it's gonna be scary, but... John is on my hit list. He's been on my hit list since he sent Jeremy home, so... It's been a long time coming, I need to make some moves soon. Natalie pulled off a series of stellar moves in the endgame with her faux allies, first by quote-unquote accidentally voting out the wrong person, only to gain an ally moving forward, then by splitting the vote on John, the guy she was laying in wait to cut for a while, and then by playing an idol on the person on the bottom at the final five, to both secure a second ally, as well as to impress the jury with her bold, individual move. Natalie positioned herself incredibly well, better than most players ever could, and this secured her spot in the final three, where she easily won in a 5-2-1 vote. Nat aligned the stars through her own doing, and hit a series of home runs leading into the endgame to secure a well-earned victory that truly demonstrated it's not about losing your 20 in the first episode, it's not about how you start, but how you finish. The winner of Survivor San Juan del Sur, Natalie! 
with the winner of Season 30, Survivor Worlds Apart, White Collar versus Blue Collar versus uh, No Collar. We have Mike Holloway, an oil driller from Texas who was placed on the six person blue collar Escameca tribe. Out of the gate, Mike hit the ground running. He instantly bonded with Dan as the two of them were presented with a conflict. Think for the tribe or think for themselves. The two of them chose to be the good guys, which I found fitting given the overall narrative Mike will have through the course of the season. Mike butted heads with another strong personality in Rodney, a young whippersnapper from Boston, Boston Rod you could say, and these two continuously had conflicts of personality. Mike was a worker, a hard worker, constantly wanted to be moving and this occasionally rubbed the tribe the wrong way, which would then lead to arguments. A lot of arguments. Nonetheless, this blue collar tribe didn't have to go to tribal until they were four episodes deep, and Mike was in a solid alliance with Dan, Kelly, and Rodney, leaving Sierra and Lindsay on the outs. To ensure an idol wouldn't be used effectively, his alliance split the vote two and two, and out went Lindsay. Right after this, a tribe swap occurred, and Mike was placed on a seven person tribe with three of the other blue collars, as well as white collars Tyler and Joaquin, and Joe, a lone no caller. Rodney bonded with Joaquin, and this bromance would spook Mike. He didn't want Rodney to get too powerful for Mike's own good. Another pressing issue was how Kelly, another close ally of Mike's, was the only blue caller on the other swapped tribe, which meant that she would be easy pickings. However, Kelly did become a key figure on that tribe, and she did not get voted out in episode five, However, in episode six, Rodney had an idea to throw the challenge to vote Joe out to prevent the no callers from getting too powerful at the merge. Mike wasn't a big fan of this idea of throwing challenges, but he went along with it. However, after the challenge was thrown in an amusing fashion, no less, Mike decided not to vote out Joe, but to vote out Joaquin instead. Oh, that is juicy. Mike recognized how close Rodney and Joaquin were with each other, and yeah, he didn't want Rodney to get any bright ideas. Mike scooped up Joe, as well as utilizing Dan and Sierra, the two blue collars, to vote out Joaquin, blindsiding Rodney in the process. Rodney would not forget that. Also needs to be said, Mike did a decent job of getting Sierra back on the blue collar side after she was blindsided when Lindsay was voted out because neither Rodney nor Dan seemed all that impressive with how they approached her. At the final 12, the tribes merged and the blue collars had five members strong alongside the remaining white collars in Carolyn and Tyler. This super alliance held the majority seven out of 12 and they waffled between voting for Jen or Haley, two no collar players. Mike ultimately called a shot here being the leader. He picked Jen, which proved to be the wrong choice as Jen held an idol and played it on herself. And because Kelly had flipped on her swapped allies who were these no callers, the no callers all voted out Kelly, Mike's ally. However, in spite of Kelly leaving, the big alliance still held a six to five majority. And in fact, Will from the no caller tribe had jumped ship already making it seven to four. The minority no callers were in trouble. And so they get picked off here. For First starting with Haley because Joe kept winning immunity and then Joe who went at the final 10. Mind you, Joe tried to build a fake idol that wasn't actually half bad because he couldn't find the real idol. And that's because around prior, Mike had managed to get Tyler to tell him the clue that Joe shared with Tyler about the location of the idol. That was a lot of names. This information that Mike manages to get from Tyler, from Joe, this information sharing would prove to be very crucial for Mike as he used this information about the location of the idol to not only sideline Joe, framing him as if he actually found it, making everyone believe that he held it, but he would also then go on to find the actual real idol himself. Yes. That's what we do, baby. We do the happy dance. Happy day. Are you kidding me right now? So Joe gets voted out and we get to the final nine, the faded final nine round where everything just gets blown up in Mike's face in one fell swoop. At the top of the episode, Mike discovers that Rodney had put together a new alliance of four between himself, Carolyn, Tyler, and Will. This alliance would pick off Jen and Shireen. And then at seven, they would seize the day with the numbers picking off Mike, Dan, and Sierra too. And you know what? It's actually not a bad idea. 
Mike overhears them scheming and decides to blow this up. But first, the auction. The last time the auction, sadly, would be seen in Survivor through 40 seasons. Mike pulls off a half-measure attempt here to game the auction when the loved one's letters come out. Basically, everyone will go up and give Jeff their money so everyone gets a letter. However, Mike decides to go back on his word after everyone but him has given up their money. He goes back and he sits down on the bench meaning he will have enough money to buy the advantage over everyone else. Because, of course, there's always some kind of an advantage at the auction. Mike tricks everyone here by abusing their trust. However, he then goes back on his move after the backlash he receives, and he does give up his money to get the letter. He basically gets no upside and all of the downsides with either direction he goes in. Because of this move, everyone gets pissed at him and Rodney exacerbates the focus on Mike, rallying the majority alliance to target him next. Rodney pulls in Dan and Sierra and turns them on Mike because Mike is no longer a good guy and the good guys gotta win and Dan just can't support being a bad guy. But Mike wins immunity both at the final nine and the final eight, and so Jen and Shireen, two other players on the bottom, go out next. Mike attempts a decent Russian roulette kind of vote at the final eight too, bluffing about playing his idol on Shireen, but it doesn't pan out. Good attempt though. Mike is now facing a six to one deficit with no allies. Literally every episode is insanity in that he is just doing the same thing over and over. Mike tries to convince Dan and Sierra again and again that Rodney is leading them off a cliff. They're screwed, but they don't really listen. Not to mention, Mike is a big threat to win anyway, so why would they really want to go to the end with him? At the final seven, Mike doesn't win immunity, but he's got that idol he found from a while ago and he plays it, securing him safety. He targets Tyler as his biggest threat to win and so out goes Tyler. At the final six, Mike wins immunity yet again. All that hard work is paying off. And he convinces Carolyn to wake up and smell the coffee. They're turning on her now. And so she plays her idol from the premiere episode to save herself. That said, Mike still never has any allies, but he goes on to win immunity for the rest of the way at the final five and the final four, first voting off Sierra and then tying the vote up at the final four to force Rodney to go to fire against Mama C. Rodney was actually a decent threat to win, but he couldn't make fire to save himself and Mike was now in the final three with Mama C and, uh, and Will. Mike easily trounced the other two by just sheer force. He won five immunities, tying the record, played an idol correctly, pulled off some nice blindsides, and while I wouldn't say overall his win was that high up in regard to strategy or social maneuvering or tactical finesse, it was still impressive to watch as he is the only player to this day to really win the game by just being really, really good at challenges. Blue collar strong! The winner of Survivor. <laughs> From season 31, Survivor, Cambodia, second chance, it's Jeremy. Yep, Natalie's number one ally from season 29, Jeremy returned two seasons later for an all-star second chance season and was ready to prove to the world he was the real deal. He was a colossus of a presence in his first season, enough that his alliance turned on him halfway into the game, so this time, he needed to adjust his strategy for the better if he wanted any hope of standing a chance to win. And given I'm now talking about him, he definitely did. There's a lot to be said about the pregame alliances going into this season, as is typical with any returning player season, including season 40. But suffice it to say, much like many of the winners, Jeremy didn't have to rely on them too much, given he didn't go to Tribal Council in the pre-merge except for one time. He was in the early Majority Alliance out of the gate on his original tribe, and then when the tribe swap happened, he was still in a solid majority alongside his allies, Steven and Kimmy. They picked off a player they didn't trust, and for the most part, the pre-merge for Jeremy was smooth sailing. He did go through two swaps this time instead of just one, but his tribe won immunity. That said, Jeremy took an approach of keeping the big players around instead of targeting them, something that seemed counter to other players' strategies, such as his ally Steven. To Jeremy's credit, he learned from his first season and his loss that the tallest nail gets the hammer, and when he took out his biggest opposition last time, he suddenly became the big man on campus. So this time he enacted a meat shield strategy to protect himself in the event that his alliance was targeted. He wouldn't be the first to fall and could maneuver from there. I want to do choke for us. 
Steve is definitely digging his heels and he wants Joe out, but I need a shield. I need Joe around as long as possible. I do not want to be the biggest guy out here. This strategy proved effective in many ways as one of his closest allies, Andrew Savage, was idled out at the final 12. That easily could have been Jeremy. A few votes later, Jeremy, who was holding on to two idols at this point, saw that another of his shields was being targeted, so he went against the grain and he played one of those idols to keep his numbers solid. Although the same alley was then voted out in the next Tribal Council anyway, but hey, it bought Jeremy time. While Cambodia is known for having a ton of moving parts all season, the end game came down to Jeremy forming a solid core four and then three alliance between Spencer, Tasha, and Kimmy, and given it was the final seven, they held the majority. At the final six, however, things got spicy. As Kimmy decided to flip on him and voted against him, but he played his second idol to keep himself safe and then forced Kimmy out of the game by default, given Jeremy's biggest rival, Kelly, played an idol on herself as well. It was a very complicated tribal council. I would just say, if you haven't seen it, Jeff Probst brought a chalkboard out at the reunion to explain what was going on, so... Yeah. But with the numbers on his side at the final five with Spencer and Tasha, Jeremy was seen as the leader who made the most moves and the best moves all game, and he was in good standing with all of the jurors. Likewise, he had a season-long secret that he kept to himself until the very end where he revealed that he had learned, thanks to the family visit, the gender of the child he and his wife were having together. I mention this not because it won Jeremy the game, far from it, but because it played a major part in his narrative for the season, it was his motivation to return to play a strong game, having learned from his mistakes. Jeremy was intelligent and loyal, a strong all-arounder who won a season with some of the stiffest competition you will ever see. And given Winners at War is pretty much just that, perhaps we may be in store for more of the same. The winner of Survivor Second Chance, Jeremy. Which brings us to our final winner for part three from season 32, Survivor Korong, Brains vs. Brawn vs. Beauty. Two. We have Michelle Fitzgerald of the Beauty Tribe, who is returning on season 40 to play for her second chance at a second million. Yes, the theme of Brains Brawn Beauty returned and Michelle apparently wasn't super smart or super strong, but she was super pretty. So here we are. But then she did win three individual challenges, two of them individual immunities. Did you win two individual immunities, Tony? Did you? But no, really, I am more excited to see Michelle back <laughs> than most of this cast. She may be the biggest wild card of any returning player given her road to victory in her first season, so, I'm keen to see what she brings this time. Of the entire cast on season 40, Michelle has been to the least amount of tribal councils, like the opposite of Denise. She also didn't go to a tribal council until there were only 10 players remaining. She began the season by aligning with two other girls on her tribe, Anna and Julia. However, her tribe never went to tribal council before the swap hit, so even though the girls were close, we never really saw what would have happened had they lost a challenge. But kind of like Natalie or Denise, it's not about where you start, it's where you finish. Her beauty tribe did lose a member in Caleb who was medevaced in episode four, probably the most harrowing medical evacuation in all of Survivor. But at the swap, Michelle was put in a dubious position. There were two beauty, two brawn, and two brain. It's possible the beauty would get ganged up on, but again, her tribe never lost immunity, so she was safe. Going into the merge, Michelle was able to reconnect with her ally, Julia, and together, alongside several of the other women, the girls blindsided the guys and voted out Nick, who was Michelle's closest ally through the swap, who was originally from her beauty tribe. But Michelle didn't really need Nick at this point, and he was closer to the brawn guys anyway, so see ya. Michelle then took part in one of the craziest moves of the season with the blindside of Debbie being one of four votes in a four to three to two vote alongside Aubrey, Sydney, and Julia to vote out the crazy cat lady, Debbie. Michelle was never calling the shots, but she was along for the ride, and why not? From this point, Michelle was seemingly riding high. She was in the majority and eliminating the people she was voting for. And then, it all came undone. At the final eight, Michelle was left on the outs after her previous allies found greener pastures. She was voting out Ty, but that didn't happen. Scott went instead. So, at the final seven, she became an underdog, down in numbers three to four, with her number one ally, Julia, being targeted for elimination. 
Michelle made a very subtle and perhaps her biggest move here by ingratiating herself with the majority and voting out her best friend in the game. Julia went, and with her it seemed Michelle was only in a deeper hole than before. Her come from behind story was now at its peak, especially with the final six. That vote was between her and Jason, and the majority alliance, despite being split on who to vote out, chose Jason. Ty wasn't happy with that choice, but then Ty was just speaking a bunch of malarkey, wasn't he? So Michelle, you know where you sit in that group. I know where Ty thinks I sit in that group, and if that's where the rest of my alliance thinks I sit in that group, then that's a shame. I mean, it sounds like a bunch of malarkey to me, but whatever. At the final five, Michelle gets bailed out pretty hard as Joe gets medevaced, a guy who was a lock for the final three. And then, at the final four, Michelle wins immunity, and voila, million dollars, here we come. Michelle was a major underdog who zigged just enough when she needed to to avoid packing her bags, and the jury liked her enough, her story of rags to riches, and awarded her the win as she stood strong, proud of all she'd accomplished to get there. Michelle is a fighter, she is scrappy, she is full of snark, and she understands the game, and her social game was her biggest drawing point, which is the most important part in Survivor. And dare I say, if anyone feels most poised to go the distance in Winners at War, give it up for the gal who may be going into the season with the least experience handling Mr. Jeffrey Probst. The winner of Survivor, Michelle. <laughs> Winner number 16 on the chronological list is Adam Klein from Survivor, Boomers vs. Zoomer, er, no, Millennials vs. Generation X. Yes, division by age, or division by whether you spell the word you with three letters or one. Anyway, Adam Klein was on the Millennials tribe and is a super duper fan of Survivor. He shouts his geekiness for Survivor from the hilltops, and Adam, hey, right there with you. Because the theme of the season was younger versus older, Adam was of course on the younger tribe, surrounded by people who were younger in the cast, and out of the gate, he bonded most strongly with Mari. And then, at his first tribal council, Mari was blindsided. Fair play. Adam was in a bad spot, but he scraped back into seemingly good standing with the rest of his tribe, and from there, after the millennials won several challenges, the tribe swap hit. With the tribe swap, Adam became a swing vote on his newly swapped tribe of five. There were two Gen Xers and two Millennials, Figgy and Taylor. Figgy and Tay Tay, Figtails, they were showmance. They liked each other, and Adam had tried to get Figgy out at his first tribal council. Being the swing vote, he chose to go against his former tribe mates and sided with the Gen Xers, voting out Figgy. And now, Taylor was mad. So, right away we get to the merge, and this is really where Adam's game blows up, largely thanks to Taylor. Adam tries to patch things up with Taylor by letting him in on a secret he found an advantage, but Taylor wasn't warming up to Adam after he voted Figgy out. So basically, Taylor goes back to his Millennial Alliance and gets them to target Adam. They can't trust him, and he's way too shifty. Meanwhile, the Gen Xers decide to take advantage of this divided Millennial group, and they all target Michelle, a Millennial. Alongside Zeke and Hannah, two other Millennials, Adam joins them and continues to take down his prior Millennial tribe mates, although Taylor continues to blow up Adam's game as he goes down swinging. From there, the Gen Xers decide to host a civil war. Can't get too comfortable. Where at the final 10, a 5-5 deadlock tie happens and rocks are drawn. Adam's side loses, and suddenly he's in a rough spot at the final 9, down in numbers 4-5. to five. That is, until one of the numbers from the other side, Will, flips, intending to ping pong back and forth between alliances, something Adam wanted to do first. Will flips, and then Zeke gets taken out. It's important to note here that there were two leaders vying for power between these two groups, Zeke and David. Adam was on David's side, alongside Hannah and Ken. When Will flipped at the final nine, betraying his previous alliance, those same players decided to then turn on Will at the final eight. From there, the four-pack of Adam, David, Ken, and Hannah controlled the votes at the final seven and proceeded to pick off Sunday and Jay, but not before Adam revealed to Jay the reason that Adam was fighting so hard to win this game. All season long, Jay and Adam were like rivaling brothers who never seemed to be on the same page, and when Jay pleaded to Adam to keep him around, 
Adam revealed that he couldn't because Jay was too big of a threat. He was just way too damn likable. And as much as Adam liked Jay, Adam was here to win. I can't waste my opportunity. Can I tell you something that I haven't told anyone in this game? What? My mom has stage four lung cancer. It's been so much to me. I'm doing it for her. That's why I can't waste this opportunity. Me and Adam are both out here for our families, for our moms. He's not a weasel in my book anymore. He's a good freaking dude, he's a warrior. Adam tried to target David at the final five, the biggest threat remaining in the game at that point, but he seemed outnumbered between Ken and Hannah. So at the final four, he did finally convince Ken, or Ken convinced himself either way, to pick off David, who was a shoe in to win over any of them. That was key to Adam's game, and it's something that I feel like gets overlooked. Make sure that he was never the leader, as the leaders just kept getting targeted. And make sure that he was never the most threatening or the most likable. Always be one step behind the best so that by the end, his threat level will be perfectly middling and he will always have a spot and a seat at the final tribal council. Kudos to him, he manages his threat level really well. So Adam reached the final three with Ken and Hannah and he revealed at the very end at tribal council that his mother was sick, she had cancer, and he was out there fighting for her. And similar to Jeremy, as the jurors revealed ahead of time and postseason, Adam had won the game before he revealed this information. But that information certainly doesn't hurt him. Survivor is a game all about people, and powerful stories absolutely assist in convincing and moving others towards voting for you. Regardless of whether it's from a strategic point of view, a strategic angle or not, yeah. Reveal that information, dude. It's going to win you a million dollars for your family. Adam won all 10 jury votes, fulfilled a lifelong dream, and now he's back to compete against the best. As if getting on the show wasn't already a dream, he then won the show, and now he's in the arena of champions. The winner of Survivor Millennials vs. Gen X, Adam. With season 34, Survivor Game Changers, we saw Sarah Lucina, the good cop turned bad cop, or criminal, who had returned from being a merge boot and victim to Tony from season 28, Kageon. Game Changers was an all-star season with 20 returning players, including former winner Tony as well as Sandra, and so Sarah really had her work cut out for her. But I think being a smaller fish and a cast so big allowed her room to maneuver, to lay low when she needed to. Her reputation wasn't so strong going into the season, given her standing from her first time out, so what might she do differently now? Well, much like many of the winners, Sarah had the luxury of not attending tribal council until a second swap in the season when a quarter of the cast was already gone. A lot of crazy things went down up to this point but Sarah was sort of low in the grass out of the action building strong enough bonds with everyone to where everyone felt comfortable with her and wanted her on their side. No longer was she cocky or demanding but instead sly cunning and stealth. Her second tribe swap lost both immunity challenges, but she was in the majority and in fact was able to vote out Sandra, the only two-time winner, out of the game for the first time ever. This was pretty dang historic, and it's a feather in Sarah's cap heading into Winners at War. She also had a front row seat to one of the ugliest tribal councils in Survivor history that occurred right after Sandra was voted out. Jeff Farner made a really bad call by attempting to paint Zeke as untrustworthy and highly deceptive because he was transgender, which culminated in everyone, including Sarah, to unanimously expel Varner from the tribe. So going into the merge, this is where Game Changers gets really complicated. So complicated, in fact, that I think I learned more from listening to postseason podcasts about the season than I did actually watching it. To say that I am holding my breath for Winners at War being different based on what we got with Game Changers, well, we'll see. Sarah plays a really strong game here in the post-merge, and it's a testament to how strong of a player she can be. Gone were the days of Kageon. Game Changer Sarah was a different beast. Sarah seemed to have learned from Tony, the winner she lost to her first time out, and successfully flipped between alliances throughout the entire post-merge 
up until the final seven or so. First, she hops on board to take Ozzy out, thanks to Debbie. Then she votes Debbie out after Debbie feels 100% secure with Sarah. But then Sarah pulls off a gutsy move and flips on a potential new ally in Sierra, who reveals to her she has a special advantage that can only be used at the final six. Sierra confides in Sarah about this twist and says that if she gets voted out, she'll will it to Sarah. I mean, it's us, right? I love you. You're my, like, it girl out here. Like, I'm with on you. a real level. Right. I don't want to vote her out. But this isn't about making friends. This is about winning a million dollars. So Sarah votes her out. And Sierra gives it to her, believing Sarah was on her side the whole time. Whoops. But good on Sarah for pulling that off, damn. And then, of course, Sarah goes back and flips on the alliance that she was working with to take out Andrea, and then things get super complicated with the final seven last minute swerve to take out Michaela. When I tell you that this vote was stupidly complicated and it would take me several minutes to break this vote down just to explain it, take my word for it. Sarah decides at the last minute to use a double vote to hamper Sari, takes out Michaela, and then pretty much guarantees herself a spot in the final three after that. Because at the final six, Sarah had that special advantage from Sierra, the legacy advantage. Two idols were played by the opposing alliance of three, and that meant that the one player with no immunity, Sari, was voted out by default. Bummer. Sarah goes on to reach the final three with her two allies, Troyzan and Brad, and beats them both pretty handily. She played a cutthroat game where she won just about everyone over and then used their friendship against them. So many daggers were placed so subtly into the backs of the jurors, and that's the game of Survivor to a T. Sarah did a great job at convincing them it was her best play, and she deserved their vote. Going into Winners at War, she is the reigning All-Stars champ, so I'll be very curious to see how she handles another returning player cast, especially one with a much more game-changing resume to tout. The winner of Survivor Game Changers, Sarah. Going down the line, season 35, Heroes vs. Healers vs. Hustlers, it featured Ben, the Cowboy Marine, who is easily best known for the sheer amount of idol hunting he underwent and the amount of idols he subsequently played to put himself in a position to reach the end. Ben bombs. Everywhere. Ben is well known for his idol plays, finding idols left and right, and I would be remiss if I didn't start his segment by mentioning that. But beyond the idols, which he began using at the Final 7 onward, many tend to overlook that he played a rather strong game leading up to that point. Ben began the season placed on the Heroes Tribe, a tribe of people who behaved heroically for a living, like an NFL player or an actuary. He ingratiated himself right into a four-person alliance for the first episode in the First Tribal Council, where he was safely in the numbers for the first vote. However, that same alliance pretty much blew itself up by day three, and so he bonded mostly with Chrissy, the woman kinda on the outs at that point. From here, Ben never went back to tribal council until the merge, though he was swapped into a tribe where he was in the minority, but never that likely of going home. He had a feud with a guy named Cole because Cole ate a lot of food. It was a long pre-merge. Going into the merge, the remaining heroes and hustlers banded together and formed a coalition to take out the remaining healers. From here, three straight healers were voted out, leading us to the final nine. Along the way, Ben joined a sub-alliance consisting of himself, Devin, Lauren, and Ashley. Ben began to work undercover to trick the remaining other five players into believing he was not in a sub-alliance, he was simply along for the ride. So at the final nine, the biggest blindside and turning point of the season happened when Ben's sub-alliance turned on JP, a player who was in the majority. This created a lot of chaos going forward, and Ben was positioned stealthily in the middle of it all, acting like he was shocked that JP was blindsided despite actually being in on the plan the entire time. However, at the final seven, things took a turn for the worse for Ben. Despite being in the majority, and in a majority sub-alliance who were running the game, his sub-alliance of Lauren, Ashley, and Devin decided to turn on him, and Ben caught wind of it. Ben also had an idol in his pocket from earlier in the game, and so he whipped it out when everyone else was least expecting it and played it for himself, causing the first ever single vote elimination outside of a final three in Survivor history, where six players voted for him, none of the votes counted, and he voted for Lauren, the loudest player wanting him out. Ben became a marked target for every round going forward, and if he didn't win immunity or find an idol, 
he was a goner. However, by sheer force and willing it into existence, Ben found idols. At the final six and the final five, he found an idol and played an idol and thus could not be voted out until the final four. Ben Ball. La la la. While you guys are sleeping, oh what's that gosh. saying? The early bird gets a worm? And so, at the final four, he didn't win immunity and there were no more idols in play, so it seemed as if his nine lives were up. He was a clear goner. Until he wasn't. A surprise Final Four fire-making twist popped up and drastically shifted how the endgame would pan out. Suddenly, whoever won immunity would select one other player to take to the final three, and the remaining two players would compete in a fire-making challenge to determine who would sit in the last seat at the final three. So Ben did get lucky here, and he built a fire faster than Devin, and he was now in that final three. And because he was this explosive underdog, dropping bombs left and right, finding idols, playing a pretty good game up to that point, the jury felt he was deserving enough to nab a win. Make no mistake, Ben is definitely one of, if not the most controversial winner in the game, at least for Modern Survivor, but not so much for anything that he really did as as a person or a player, more so because of how he won, with the idols being found again and again, and then the surprise fire making happening out of left field. Personally, I've never held this against Ben, even though I think many others have. It really could have been anyone, it just happened to be him. Ben is quite underrated because of all this controversy, and I think despite being a big target, He's actually not perhaps that threatening of a player. Just make sure you don't let him out of your sight, otherwise he may have another signature Ben Bomb up his sleeve. The winner of Survivor, Ben! <laughs> With season 36, Survivor Ghost Island, yes, Ghost Island, I said that, you heard me right, that's the season name, we had Wendell win with a rather impressive game played from start to finish. Wendell began the season by forming a strong bond with a guy named Dominic. The two of them were seemingly inseparable, figuratively and literally. Wendell never went to tribal council on his starting tribe, but he did have to attend his first one when the tribe swapped with 18 players in the game. Without a doubt, this first tribal council was Wendell's worst, as one of his closest allies, Morgan, was blindsided in a 4-3-1 vote by the opposing tribe who just basically outplayed Wendell and Dominic. Wendell's opposition took advantage of a crack in his original tribe, and yeah, Wendell was shook. Never again. So of course, after that unfortunate result, Wendell never went back to tribal until the merge. Along the way, he made several new allies, new friends, particularly with Laurel and Donathan from the opposing tribe, and once the merge hit, there was a major clash of the titans between Dominic, Wendell's number one ally, and Chris, another big player. Wendell attempted to mend bridges between the two to see if they could work together going forward, but it didn't happen, and so, Chris was completely blown out of the water in a 10 to 2 vote, despite him having an idol in his pocket. Oh yeah, and Wendell totally shut him down in his voting confessional. From here, the amount of power Wendell and Dominic had on the cast was pretty noticeable. Chris had tried to rally against them in the prior vote, but with Chris gone, the age of the bromance was upon us. What occurred from here was a series of eliminations of players who opposed Wendell and Dominic in some fashion, particularly Libby and then Dez. At the final 10, the tribe was randomly split into two, five people each, and now Wendell was kind of exposed. But this was actually where he pulled off his biggest move, managing to get his target, Michael, out of the game while also turning two of his allies against one another to prevent any rogue votes from piling on him in the event that Michael had an idol. Wendell convinced both Laurel and his other ally, Kellen, to vote for each other, furthering a schism of mistrust between the two. So are we willing to sacrifice Laurel if he does have that idol? Helen, who gets super emotional, wants to place a vote on Laurel, but she doesn't know that Laurel happens to be my ally. So if he pulls out an idol, then what happens? If you voted for Kellen, then she goes home. And if I didn't, then I go home. That's two votes, Michael. One vote Wendell, one vote Laurel, one vote Kellen, one vote Lem.
Due to all the mistrust in the tribe and nobody really being a leader to oppose Wendell or Dominic, the two guys maintained control really until the end of the game. There were bumps along the way, such as Donathan getting lippy and upset with the status quo, or Sebastian trying to use his advantage of a double vote against the two guys. In truth, I would say that Wendell's biggest opposition now at this point in the endgame was Dominic, his number one ally through the game, as Dom was a major jury threat to steal the win from him. But because Dom had an idol, and because Wendell kept winning immunity, neither were really at risk of leaving, until the final four anyway. At the final four, Dom won immunity and sent Wendell to fire making, because Wendell too was a big threat to win, and then Wendell won that fire making challenge. And then at the final three, Wendell and Dom battled against one another for their jury votes, and ultimately they found themselves deadlocked in a 5 to 5 tie. The first ever for a final tribal council in Survivor history. Wait, two winners? Well. This actually meant that Laurel, the losing finalist, would now be the final juror, as she would go on to cast her king-making vote for Wendell, giving him the win over Dom in a 6-5 final vote. Through all the craziness that went on in that season with Dom and Wendell being at the top of the pyramid, you could not ask for a more photo finish. The winner of Survivor Ghost Island, Wendell. <laughs> And last but not least, winner number 20 of 20 is Nick from season 37, David versus Goliath. This season divided the cast by whether they were viewed more as an underdog, less privileged in life, a David, or a top dog, overdog, who had a lot going for them beyond the game, a Goliath. Basically it was, here are 10 players to root for, here are 10 players to root against, have fun. But really, Nick was a David. Major identity crisis. He was on the David's tribe, I'll say that. And right away he was targeted to be the first boot. Or at least he was one of the names thrown around prior to that first tribal council. Nick entered the season super gung-ho, ready to play, probably too eager to play. Basically like any hyped up super fan. And this got him targeted. But then one of his tribe mates was medically evacuated on the way back to camp and Nick was potentially spared from being the first boot. From there, Nick takes part in a juicy 5-4 blindside in the next episode, where he works alongside his alliance mate Christian, the Mason-Dixon alliance, and they become the swing votes to determine the early course of the game. Well, that is until the next episode when a tribe swap hits, and Nick is at a numbers disadvantage 3-2, to two, but there happens to be a player in their tribe with a not so welcome presence, and so Nick connects with two Goliaths, Mike and Angelina, and the three of them form a majority, which turns out to be a pretty good move given they not only survive the next two vote-offs, but also go on to become the final three of the season. Not entirely intentionally, but it's still a fun little point worth noting. So the merge hits, and the Davids are at a disadvantage 7-6, to six, which leads to them losing another member at the first post-merge vote. From here, however, Nick pulls off arguably his best move of the season where he learns vital information from the Goliaths about who the actual target is. Nick had ingratiated himself well with the Goliath majority and so several of them wanted to keep Nick as a pocket vote for future tribals. They told Nick that Christian was the real target and Nick relayed this info to Christian. Meanwhile, Davey, a fellow ally of Nick's, had an idol, and so the three guys planned a genius move to split the David vote. Three votes are gonna go on John, three votes on Angelina, in the event that the Goliaths countered Davy's idol on Christian with one of their own. And that is exactly what happened. But because Nick split the vote, John, a Goliath, went home. I'm sorry I had to hide this from you guys, but I think you'll understand. And... I'm nervous, Jeff, but I'm more nervous for Christian. This is for him. This is the first time in Survivor history that we split the minority vote. And basically, I made a plan. We put three votes on John and two on Angelina. And that way, if the glass play an idol, a glass is still going home. And it worked perfectly. And then the Davids all banded together and utilized a few more aces up their sleeve, such as a double vote and an idol nullifier, to stop the Goliaths dead in their tracks. However, not all fairy tales have a happy ending, and happily ever after had not rolled onto the screen just yet. At the final nine, Nick was blindsided when his ally Carl was voted out after Christian and Abby decided to stir the pot 
and cause a little chaos. Entropy. Let's not rest on our laurels so quickly. Christian and Gabby flipped the vote on the Davids, and this in turn caused them to get picked off at the next two tribals. Although again, Nick had bonded with the remaining Goliaths well enough that he was seen as a valuable number, and kudos to him for that. Nick lost his last true remaining ally and Davy at the final six, a vote he did not see coming, as he was now the last remaining David in the entire game. Despite this, however, Nick went on to win three straight immunities to finish the season, didn't even need to make a fire at the final four, and he gave a great pitch to the jury as to why he best deserved the win and to represent the David versus Goliath season as its champion. Also, the runner-up of the season, Mike White, kind of lost his will to win the game. Bad timing. Nick is the most recent winner in the Winners at War cast, and I gotta wonder if being in that position makes him a bigger target than he might be, and or perhaps best suited to excel at the modern iteration of the game. I don't think he's a huge threat despite being top of mind, and I kinda wonder if he'll be overlooked in comparison to so many other big personalities. Is Nick still that David in a cast full of Goliaths? The winner of Survivor, <laughs> David Nick! <laughs> so... Now we get to season 38, Survivor, Edge of Extinction, and boy oh boy, how long can I make this entry? Chris Underwood, a sales manager from South Carolina, would be the next sole survivor, but as most of us are aware, he won the game in the most unorthodox way we have ever seen. First up, Chris was placed on the nine-person Blue Manu tribe, which would be joined by two returning players, that of Kelly Wentworth and David Wright. Chris allied himself in the Majority Alliance, which held six strong, forcing Reem, Keith, and Wendy on the bottom. This Majority was able to split their vote, and they lost the first challenge, making Reem the first one out. From there, Keith was targeted next, another player on the bottom, as Manu had quickly become another disaster tribe that was losing just about every challenge. In fact, the Manu tribe goes to every single pre-merged tribal council, even though they do get swapped around in episode 4, still, Manu was kinda cursed. So cursed, in fact, that in episode 3, on day 8, they lose their third immunity challenge in a row. David was targeting Kelly, the other returning player, and he had brought in both Rick and Wendy. He just needed one more vote, and so he approached Chris, given Kelly was close with Lauren and Wardog. Chris became a bit of a swing vote between these two trios, either vote off Kelly or vote off Wendy. But Chris wanted to keep his options open going forward. He didn't want to vote off Kelly, only to just lose trust with Wardog and Lauren, so he approached Wardog to keep the guy in the loop. This, however, may have been a fatal mistake, as Wardog trusted Kelly over Chris. He viewed Kelly as a bigger shield than Chris, and so he went back and he rallied Wentworth and Lauren, only to then approach Rick and soon David. And what did he do? He targeted Chris. Chris became the target, and now David and Rick were in the middle. They ultimately decided to join forces with the other trio, as the tribe swap was right around the corner, and they knew this, and they would rather have a strong tribe, a unified tribe, heading into that than a fractured one. Basically, everyone was on the same page except for Wendy, and, well, what's new? So, by a vote of 5-2, to two, Chris Underwood was voted out unceremoniously as the third boot of Survivor, Edge of Extinction. So now let's get to season 39, Survivor, Island of the- Okay, okay, nope, it's not over just yet. The season is called The Edge of Extinction for a reason, so what happens next is that Chris, who just got voted out, gets sent to a small beach for basically the rest of the game where he hangs out until he either re-enters the main game at the merge or at the final six. Chris is joined by everyone else who gets voted off, what's up Rick Devins, and he becomes a pretty good provider for this Edge tribe. He catches a stingray, he ponders about his imperfect game, about the concept of failure, he really reflects on himself and his loss, and he looks inward on how he's going to recover from there. He then fails to re-enter the game at the merge, losing to Rick in the challenge, and so back to the edge he goes. At this point, we can basically fast forward to day 35, with five players left in the game, 
Chris gets that second chance to re-enter and voila, he wins the challenge, even beating out the likes of Joe, I should mention, the biggest challenge beast in Survivor history. Chris re-enters the game after being voted out on day eight. It's now day 35 and off we go. He reconnects with Rick Devins, who's also on the bottom, and they join forces. Rick is holding an idol and he plans to play it at the next vote if he doesn't win immunity, which he doesn't. Chris also held a half idol, where if he survived the final six vote, it would be a full idol at the final five. Ridiculously powerful, but whatever. He gives the other half to Rick to hold on to. Chris also approaches Lauren from his original Manu tribe way back when, and he knows that she's holding an idol too. He convinces her to work with him and have her play the idol on him tonight, ensuring he survives to the final five so the two of them can work together to the end. Because Chris wasn't a huge threat. He'd barely been in the game. He had yet to even meet Victoria Julie or Gavin, the other half of this tribe. Chris also knew about Lauren's idol because Kelly brought it up on the edge and he also knew that Kelly wanted Lauren to make a big move. She hadn't yet and this was her chance. Save Chris. Give Victoria out, the biggest threat left. So she did, she played her idol on him and now he was locked into the final four, given Rick gave the other half of Chris's idol back at the final five. This is a lot of idol talk. Chris had a full idol to play on himself and when Rick won immunity, it was guaranteed that he was getting votes. He got three, but he played his idol and yeah, out went Lauren as Rick played his idol on Gavin and Julie, well, I don't believe Julie was perceived as a big threat to win. At the final four, Chris won immunity and was locked into the final three, but he had intended for all of this to be the case. At the final five, he did not want to win immunity, so he threw the challenge to play the idol knowing he was safe. But now at the final four, he wanted to win immunity and he did, just so that he could do what he was about to do. When I got voted out the first time, I got blindsided and I am not going to let that happen again. Trust your gut. I feel like I'm at a high stakes poker table and I have a hand that might win, but it also might not. So I might have to be just flat out daring. Stick all my chips in and let whatever happens gonna happen. All bets are off. It's for a million dollars, man. It's the biggest risk I'm taking. So tonight, I am offering up my immunity necklace. Oh my. Giving it to Julie. And I will be making fire against Rick Dennis tonight. Wow. Chris beasted that fire and he beat Rick, knocking him out, landing Chris in the final three with Julie and Gavin. And for me personally, I'm of two minds about all of this. This is both impressive in execution, but I don't give a ton of kudos to Chris only because it was planned over on the edge, mostly by Wardog from what I've heard. And it was basically Chris's road to victory to even stand a chance to win. However, like I just said, on the other hand, Chris did pull it off and it was fun to watch and the jury was eating it up. And hey, if that's what the jury wants, that's what the jury's gonna reward. Chris validated most of the jury by being in the shoes they wished they were in. He sold his case to win rather well and ultimately won the game 9-4-0 to to zero over Gavin and Julie, being the first player to ever get voted out and then go on to still win the same season. Didn't think I could say that much about Chris, but hey, there was something. The winner of Survivor, Edge of Extinction, Chris. That's enough. Season 39. Island of the Idols, we get Tommy Sheehan, a teacher, one of the more noteworthy players in that he won the game without winning immunity or finding an idol or having an idol played on him or any advantage, and he didn't even have to make a fire. Tommy is the antithesis of everything modern Survivor stands for and tries to push, and I find that amusing. Tommy began on the 10-person Purple Vokai tribe, which would prove to be the more dominant tribe of the season. Right away, he formed strong bonds with Lauren as well as Jack. Tommy had ingratiated himself well with most of the tribe to where he wasn't a target and was situated comfortably in the middle. A three-person alliance of Jamal, Jack, and Molly had made their way to the top of the hierarchy, and so at the second tribal council, a resistance was formed to upset the apple cart, knocking them off the top. 
Tommy became a swing vote to join Jason, Nora, Kelly, Lauren, basically the rest of the tribe. Originally, the vote was to be split between Jason and Nora, the two outsiders, but the vote flipped on the cool kids and out went Molly. From here, Tommy was swapped onto an eight-person tribe with four Vokai and four Lyro, meaning the vote would likely get tied. In episode six, Tommy went back to tribal after staying strong with Lauren, Dan, and Jason. These four would vote for Elaine, all while getting closer to Elizabeth, Missy, and Aaron with the hope of flipping Aaron to make the vote five to three. The problem here for Tommy was that Elaine received an advantage from the Island of the Idols, which meant that she could block a vote. And so her group blocked Jason, meaning Tommy was exposed and could have been voted out. They targeted Jason instead sending him home instead of Tommy four to three, but man, was this a close call. And then we get to the merge. And then we get to the merge. Possibly my least favorite episode in all of Survivor, Things get ugly. The tribes merge and Vokai have the numbers seven to six. Not only that, but they're all close enough to join back together. At first, Tommy speaks with Kelly about creating a new alliance of nine, merging some from Vokai and some from Lyro, but Kelly doesn't really care for this idea. It doesn't work that well for her. Tommy feels like he's not as secure as he had hoped with his fringe Vokai allies, and he notices that Kelly is getting close to Missy, a player Tommy was intending to target. He works closely with Lauren, and together they begin to doubt if Kelly is with them. From here, the game begins to steer in an unprecedented direction, one which Tommy is mostly not shown to be a part of. A series of events involving inappropriate touching from Dan, an ally of Tommy, towards Kelly leads to Janet sticking up for Kelly and then working to get Dan out. Janet pulls in what she believes is a majority to take out Dan because screw that guy. She gets Jamal, she gets Karishma, she gets Nora, she gets Kelly. They form together and expect to also have Missy and Elizabeth at the very least. This would give numbers to override Tommy's swing vote position, but this vote doesn't work out for Janet as Missy and Elizabeth believe they were being fooled. It's a very complicated moment that leads to this merge being very difficult to watch, but Tommy sides with the Alliance to take out Kelly and she doesn't play either of her two idols that she's holding and she goes out eight to five. After this vote, Tommy's comfortably in the middle, relatively distanced from the fallout of the merge vote and all that it entailed. His Alliance splits the vote on Janet and Jamal, getting Janet to play an idol and then at the final 11, the merge tribe gets split into two. Tommy is placed alongside Elaine, Karishma, Elizabeth, and Missy, the four Lyra women, and it would appear he is in a lot of hot water seeing as both tribes are forced to attend tribal. Karishma had no love for Missy or Elizabeth, particularly Missy, and Elaine was feeling it too. She liked Karishma and Tommy, and once Missy targeted Tommy, yeah, it was a no-go. Tommy was closer to Elaine than others realized, and while he received two votes here, Missy received three, sending her packing. These would be the only two votes Tommy received against him all season, despite not being immune at any point. At the final nine, the two split tribes form back together as one, and Lauren finds the idol and shares the info with Tommy. These two are still in lockstep. Nora or Elizabeth have to win. Why? If they win, I get an idol. So right now, I'm Lauren's wingman. I'm gonna do whatever I can to make sure Lauren gets that idol. So I want to get as many people I can to not play. So what are we gonna talk about all day long right now? Pancakes, syrup, bacon, coffee. And the more I talk about it, the more Lauren talks about it, the less people to compete against Nora or Elizabeth. Wow, six people gonna eat, only three people. Karishma, Nora, and Elizabeth will compete. Oh my God, did we actually just pull this off? They also sit in the middle of a big majority alliance who form back together and leave Elizabeth and Karishma on the outs. The target was Karishma, but they cast a stray vote for Elizabeth just in case of any funny business, and they misled Karishma to vote for Janet. Karishma does play an idol, but that was okay. Elizabeth just goes instead. And then they vote at Karishma in the next vote. Those four Lyra women who swapped with Tommy at the split vote are just... Man, they're just getting taken out one by one. On that note, it's the final seven, and Tommy has a majority alliance with Lauren, Dan, Dean, and Janet. Nora consistently becomes the scapegoat for the players on the bottom, and Elaine gets fooled into believing she is the majority when she isn't, as she gets voted out 5-2 to two for being very likable and an easy shoe in to win the game. Most likely from here, Tommy's plan was to take Dean and Dan to the final three, which I believe he easily wins, targeting Janet next at the final six, and then either of 
Lauren or Nora at the final five, but all of a sudden, midway through the final six round, Dan is ejected from the game for more inappropriate touching, this time of a production crew member. Dan instantly leaves, and now Tommy is in the final five. With Janet still being the target, the big issue is that she holds an idol. However, Dean had an idol nullifier advantage from the Island of the Idols, which he used against Janet, preventing her from saving herself and sending her out. At the final four, Nora won immunity, and Tommy convinced her that sending him to fire to take out Lauren, the biggest threat remaining, would be a bad move, as Tommy was bad at making fire. Except Tommy wasn't bad at it. He just didn't want to risk losing when he felt comfortable enough to win the game regardless. He just had to reach the final three. Nora decided to save Tommy and take him with her to the final tribal, watching as Dean beat Lauren in the fire making. Nora never really stood a chance to win here, and in some respects, the final tribal was a battle of old school survivor and Tommy versus new school with Dean. Dean had a lot of advantages, but was consistently on the bottom, never really calling the shots. Well, Tommy was well positioned at just about every point. He argued his case well at the final tribal council, and he won eight of the 10 jury votes, beating out Dean and Nora, demonstrating that you really don't need to make a fire or find an idol or win an advantage even 39 seasons deep. You can still just sway the vote your way each round, win people over through connections, being likable, and position yourself at the core of so many others' plans despite being the most likely to win. And I will always drink to that. The winner of Survivor, Tommy. <laughs> And now, we get to the big kahuna, the biggest kahuna of them all. We have Survivor, Season 40, Winners at War. With the man with the master plan, we have Tony Flacco's 2.0, or, well, 3.0, but a second win, now being the second player to win twice, cementing himself as, arguably, the greatest player of all time, the ultimate GOAT, if you will. That's... That's gonna confuse some people. We all know Tony, we just saw his game, the latest of the bunch as of this video, but let's cover the basics. His road to victory yet again, one more time. Tony entered the season with a huge target on his back and he was very aware of it. Didn't go so well in his second season, Game Changers, and this time around he intended to downplay his threat level. He knew that he was going to be all over the place, so if he could just rein it in, he may blend in enough to stick around for at least the first few votes and get overlooked, believe it or not, ingratiate well socially, and then go sprinting through the Fijian jungles at light speed. Which is kind of what happened. Tony connected with Sandra and Sarah early on, reigniting Cops R Us with Sarah, the most important alliance of the season. The first vote, he was in the majority, splitting the votes between Amber and Kim, sending Amber packing. Tony was laying low, wasn't out going crazy searching for idols like last time, he had refrained from building a spy shack or a bunker just yet, and it was kind of working. He actually did build a ladder, which may have been a preemptive nod towards his next spy shelter, but... Either way, his ladder led to many antics as players used it to climb trees and gather resources. In episode four, Tony was being targeted, but Tyson kind of shot himself in the foot by targeting Sandra. The rest of the tribe wasn't having it, and even though Tony was wanting lesser threats out, Tyson went next. And so the tribe swap hit, and Tony was placed on a tribe of five, alongside his ally Sandra, and then Kim, Denise, and Jeremy. Kim was gravitating toward Jeremy and Denise, and Tony did get a little manic here, attempting his spy shack shenanigans, but he was socially connected with Denise and Jeremy as much as Kim was. After his connection with Sarah, it could be argued his connection with Jeremy was the second most important of the season. In episode six, Sandra overplays her hand and pays the price, as she wants Denise to turn on Jeremy with her idol. Denise instead sends Sandra packing the Queen Slayer, and Tony was amusingly the only person in this tribe to not not have any sort of advantage on him. Yet, he skated on by to the merge. Yes, indeed, in an all winner season, Tony Vlacos made the merge. At the merge, Tony rallied the big threats together to take out the small ones. Two swap tribes, Dakal and Yara, formed together to take out Sele, targeting Wendell first. This was great for Tony as it freed up Jeremy and took out a smaller threat player, allowing his quote unquote lion alliance of big threats to remain intact. From here, Adam gets railroaded, especially given he was trying to turn on Sarah, but that didn't happen. And at the final 10, all hell broke loose when Jeremy abandoned ship and used his advantage to leave tribal 
giving Tony a numbers advantage. He worked alongside Sophie, Nick, Ben, and Sarah, who also stole Denise's vote, and they turned on Tyson. This gave them a five strong vote, or a six strong, although Michelle was also on board after all of the chaos, even allowing a split vote to occur, flushing Kim's idol in the process. From here, we get to the final nine, the famous final nine vote where Tony really begins to shine like never before. This is the Tony episode through and through. He finds an idol, overcomes a disadvantage, wins immunity, pulls off an incredible blindside. Michelle, Jeremy, Kim, and Denise were on the bottom. Tony attempts to play double agent with the minority, and this attempt splits them in half as Jeremy gravitates closer to Tony than anyone else. Tony also gets extorted here by Natalie on the edge. He has to basically run around and collect a bunch of fire tokens before the challenge, which was pretty amusing, and he manages to succeed too. Hopefully this disadvantage never returns. Kim and Denise then join the majority five, and they leave Michelle and Jeremy to the wayside. With the vote seven to two, the seven can split their numbers four and three, or five and two, and thus, Jeremy and Michelle are dead in the water. But that's where Tony comes in. He convinces Nick to join him in rallying Jeremy and Michelle, and suddenly it's no longer a majority split vote, and instead, a coup. Tony blindsides Sophie four to three to two, removing her from the board, just as he would do this in Kageon, flipping at the odd votes, trimming the fat from his alliance, pulling Sarah in closer than before. Sarah goes ballistic on him, but he weathers her storm. Kim gets taken out next despite wanting to target Tony, but of course, Tony was on an immunity streak. From the final 10 to the final eight, Tony won three straight immunities, almost enabling him to play this risky. Triple threat, yeah? My wife told me, Tony, this time you can't play wild, you can't play crazy, you can't play flashy, but I got the itch, and now this is the time for another undercover operation. In my first season, season 28 in Kageyan, I made a spy shack, and it worked. And then, game changes. My second season, I made them underground bunker. It was a failure, but it was fun. Right now, my spine has evolved, and now I'm up in the air. It's called the spy nest. It's like a bird nest that I perch myself on just like a bird, and I sit there and I wait to hear conversations that are going on. At the final seven, Tony turns on Jeremy, splitting the vote between him and Michelle. Again, he scoops people up for a quick vote, and then once they've had their use, he kind of moves on. Michelle plays her 50-50 coin, which I gotta say, by the way, Tony had also given Jeremy his idol to hold on to in the previous round to keep Jeremy closer to him, similar to Michelle giving him her coin. Jeremy plays neither, but it was a nice touch by both of them to win over Jeremy's loyalty going forward. At final six, Tony has formed a core four with Sarah, Ben, and Denise, and so they take out Nick. All while Michelle is kicking Nick for not taking out Ben the previous round when he had the chance. And because the Edge of Extinction was still in play this season, Natalie, the first boot of the season, returns, similar to Chris from season 38, and held a full-fledged idol, unlike Chris from season 38. The idea was to split the vote, two for Nat and two for Michelle, but Michelle won immunity, really clutch, by the way, and so craziness ensued. Tony, Ben, and Natalie all played idols, Michelle was safe, and so Denise had to get sent packing as Sarah was much closer to Tony and Ben and even Michelle and Natalie. Tony won immunity at the final five, launching him to the final four, and he targeted Michelle but Sarah flipped her vote to make a big move to take out Ben instead. This flummoxed Tony. He wasn't in the driver's seat with this endgame, and once Natalie won immunity at four, he was pitted against Sarah in fire making, which he almost lost. But in the end, he had to send Sarah packing, his closest ally all season, in a heartbreaking moment on night 38. Tony defeated Natalie and Michelle by a vote of 12 to four to zero, his win didn't really seem in doubt from the jury's perspective. He did a great job of coming across as humble, expressing himself with an air of humility. He was tactically brilliant. He really focused on the little things all season that paved the way for success in the big picture. Tony was still all over the place in many respects, up in the trees, over in the bushes, down on the sand, sometimes being at the mercy of others, other times calling shot after shot. But in the end, he defeated 19 other champions to claim the title of sole survivor for an all winner season, and I think that alone says it all. The winner of Survival, winner of War, Tony. Congratulations, Tony. And that is the end of the road. For those of you who watched this entire three hour video, you have my eternal gratitude. And for those of you who skipped ahead to this point just to see if I had said anything else at the very end that was new, well, I see you, but also respect.
in the end, that is all 40 winning games to date in Survivor in one long video. This is by far the longest video series I have ever made. This took me about two months to put all of this together. It's a lot. But nonetheless, I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to take a break from watching YouTube videos every now and then on your way out. Although, again, I appreciate you checking out this one. And I will see you in the next one once I maybe one day do this for International Survivor. Or maybe Big Brother. We'll see. You guys want to see the Great Cook Island Humpback Whale? <laughs> <laughs> Two naked guys in the 20 people with different skills. The one thing they have in common is they figured out how to use their skills to get to the end and win. And when you tack onto that, by the way, the prize money is double. There's nothing left to be said about it. This is going to be the best season ever, especially if I win. Okay, before we bring this to a close, Ty, do you want to let Mark go and say goodbye? <laughs> go on. Ty, you look like you're ready for some love. Who you want to see? The love of my life, Mark. Mark, come on out. So we thought it might be fun to create the Survivor prototype. So we combined all of the people who've won Survivor, and we came up with the ultimate player. And we put all these things together. We used a little bit from all of the winners and take a look at this guy that is richard hatch's left eyebrow that's sandra's right eyebrow that's uh the earlobes of poverty the dimples of jt the bottom lip of tom westman we've got ethan and amber's in there in the nose anyway if you know this guy or if you are this guy come on to survivor because you could win you don't want to smell they smoke you know what i just smell like oranges you don't know what these oranges smell like we want you to come home soon, and we want you to win the million dollars so that we can all go to Fiji. <laughs> Love you. Bye. This really is America. Who here feels I am a no collar? And that is part of it, right? Feeling free, your tattoo in your body. Yeah, doing what you want to do. So whose philosophy is the best one? White collar, blue collar, no collar? America. America. You doing my impression of Jamie? Oh my god. Jeff. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Yo, when I compete, it's on. You really do. We're all really excited. We don't really know what's going to happen. Nothing could have prepared us for this little guy. His name was Tata. The fire is the middle big and inside. If I finish the book, it was entertaining more than anything. It was just fun to watch him. You can only understand half of what he's saying anyways. He's like a Filipino golem. Oh. Ooh, but it's like a steak knife, no. Ooh, very nice, very hot.